whenever you're ready, Chair. All right. Uh, welcome to the first hearing of the Public Accountability Committee's inquiry into the government's management of the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic. The inquiry is intended to provide an ongoing parliamentary oversight to the government's response to the unfolding pandemic. Before I commence, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people, who are the traditional custodians of the land, at least that I'm on today. And I'd like to pay respects to the elders past and present of the Eora Nation and extend that respect to other Aboriginals present. Today is the first of several hearings we plan to hold for this inquiry. Today we will hear from the Honourable Brad Hazard, the Minister for Health and Medical Research, Ms Elizabeth Coff, the Secretary of New South Wales Health, and Dr Kerry Chant, the Chief Medical Officer. Before we commence the procedural formalities for the hearing, may I take this opportunity to give our heartfelt support and sympathy for those who have lost loved ones to COVID-19 and to members of our community who have been affected by it. I'd also like to acknowledge that New South Wales and indeed the nation, while suffering significantly as a result of this pandemic, has been relatively spared the large scale loss of life and illness that other countries have suffered. This is a significant achievement for which much of the credit must go to the community who once they understood the need for social distancing and what was expected of them came on board and worked together to keep each other safe. I also acknowledge the professionalism of the response shown by the health leaders appearing before us today and by our frontline health workers. While I don't doubt there may be difficult questions asked today, on behalf of the committee, I thank you for your efforts in controlling the spread of COVID-19 virus. It's also appropriate to note at the outset that there is a separate inquiry being undertaken by Mr Brett Walker SC into specific aspects of the public health response relating to the Ruby Princess cruise ship. While the establishment of that inquiry does not expressly limit the scope of this hearing, it is a matter we should be mindful of. While questioning may address certain matters related, such as the scope of the inquiry and official engagement with it, it is not the role of this inquiry to replicate or second guess the outcome of Mr Walker's investigation. I would now like to make some brief comments about the procedures for today's hearing. Today's hearing is the first of an upper house committee to be held entirely by electronic means. Like so many other things that we've needed to adapt in the face of COVID-19 public health measures, the hearings for this inquiry will be conducted via video conferencing. This enables the work of the committee to continue without compromising the health and safety of members, witnesses and staff. This being an historic first, I would ask for everyone's patience and forbearance through any technical difficulties we may encounter today. If participants lose their internet connection and are disconnected from the virtual hearing, they are asked to rejoin the hearing by using the same link as provided by the committee secretariat. Today's hearing is also being broadcast live by the Parliament's website. A transcript of today's hearing will be placed on the committee's website when it becomes available. All witnesses have a right to procedural fairness according to the procedural fairness resolution adopted by the House in 2018 and I'd ask members to be mindful of that. There may be some questions that a witness could only answer if they had more time or with certain documents to hand. In these circumstances, Witnesses are advised that they can take a question on notice and provide an answer within 21 days. Finally, could everyone please mute their microphones when they are not speaking? And indeed, the Secretariat will assist in that regard. Um, all witnesses from departments, statutory bodies or corporations will be sworn prior to giving evidence. Minister, I remind you that you do not need to be sworn as you have already sworn an, an oath of office as a member of parliament. And for all other witnesses, I ask that you each in turn that your full name, position, title and agency, and then take either an oath or an affirmation. The words for both the oath and the affirmation are on the cards in the table in front of you. Um, we might commence with you, uh, Dr Chant. Uh, Dr Chant, this is our first technical difficulty. Um, you did that. My fault. I, um, I have unmute. Oh, okay. <laughs> We might just we might just start again. Uh, Dr. Kerry Chand, New South Wales Chief Health Officer, New South Wales Health. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Thank you, Dr. Chant. Ms. Koff. Elizabeth Koff, Secretary of New South Wales Health. I swear that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So help me God. Um, thank you very much. Minister, um, if you would like to commence the hearing by making a short statement, that opportunity is available to you now. Sure, well, thank you very much. Um, look, I thank you for the interest of the, uh, the committee in uh, obviously what's a very challenging time for uh, 
not just New South Wales, not just Australia, but the whole world. Um, I want to start by uh, thanking the, uh, the incredible, uh, as you pointed out, the incredible support of the community to what we have been trying to do to keep people safe across the community. I also want to thank uh, the health staff, um, public health staff, but also the frontline staff who uh, understand the risks to them in looking after um, each and every one of us uh, uh, when we need that help. Um, I'd also particularly like to thank uh, the entire health system because I think uh, we have benefited in Australia over a long period from a very strong uh, public health system but also a, uh, a, uh, a network, if you like, between general practitioners, hospitals, state governments, federal governments, and they've all come together in this particular time. I had uh, minutes ago, I had a call from a, a Labor minister, a Labor health minister, politics uh, generally, uh, certainly across the country, the health ministers and, uh, and leaders have been put completely aside. And I want to thank uh, the uh, state and territory health ministers, um, uh, Labor and Liberal, because as I said, we've all worked together. In fact, I have a meeting again tonight with uh, all of them. And we, uh, we work on a consensus basis and ensure that uh, uh, politics is irrelevant to the decisions that are being taken in the interests of the community. I also want to just acknowledge that we've had an interesting and challenging history uh, over many years that we've addressed very well, and a lot of the learnings from that have helped. So, for example, we've had uh, challenges around HIV, uh, Hep C, um, obviously there was SARS, uh, MERS, a whole host of various challenges. And again, it's been a very bipartisan approach that has worked extremely well and particularly, I mean, the one that was most challenging to us, I would think, looking back on it, was HIV. And a lot of the lessons that came out of that bipartisanship have uh, been implemented. I want to thank uh, the uh, um, other government leaders around the country. This national cabinet structure, um, whilst obviously there are challenges, have been amazingly bipartisan in their efforts. And I want to thank them for that. Also, I want to thank the unions. Um, I have had the benefit of uh, very strong collaboration with the Health Services Union, uh, with ASMOF, the Nurses and Midwives Association, Police Association, the bus and train uh, um, uh, representatives. Uh, and I just want to thank each of them because they reflect that uh, bipartisanship that is so necessary. I also want to just indicate to uh, the committee that uh, uh, we still have challenges. Um, I think it was on the 27th of, about 27th of March. We got up to the maximum number of people that uh, had been uh, found to have COVID, um, and that was, I think, 212 um, people at that point. Uh, we sit today at three people, um, but we cannot underestimate where we're at. Um, I know there's a lot of calls and public pressure to, uh, to free up the constraints that we all have, but I think also there's a lot of people in the community who understand how dangerous this virus is. Uh, it wasn't, I mean, it's a, it's a novel coronavirus, and of course it's also mutating and it has all sorts of issues that uh, come with that. So we are still smack bang in the middle of this, uh, this uh, crisis. Uh, worldwide, there are still tens of thousands of people dying, but across our country, across the whole of Australia, um, we are seeing relatively low numbers. And uh, in some states and territories, as at today, at zero, Victoria is slightly more problematic because of particular issues, but with 22, I think it was today. But we still do face this. So I would strongly support uh, the interest of the committee, but I also ask that the committee uh, um, do whatever it can to reinforce to the community that uh, we all need to be on this journey, as you did, uh, she at the outset, thank the community for its uh, support. We have a lot more work to do. Um, I'm very happy to convey uh, to the committee uh, the, the sort of work that has been done in more detail as we progress through the questions. Uh, thank you, Minister. I'll now hand over to the opposition for the first round of questioning. Thank, thank you, Minister. Thank you, New South Wales Health Staff. Can I just, for for clarity, can you hear my? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, please. please. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. Um, Labor has provided its bipartisan support to efforts to protect the community and save lives and especially the important work on public health orders. Now, I know that they've been challenging for the community. And yes, you're right, there have been pushes to, as you said earlier in your opening statement, 
to free up constraints. And you say, yes, we are in the middle of a crisis, so we can see that. Um, I'm very aware, aware of, your, of your public health orders, and we've been following them closely. Have you updated or changed any of the public health orders overnight? No. No, you haven't. Okay. Now, would you be familiar with um, recent um, concerns in the community about people wanting to travel long, resume traveling long distances and going to rural and regional areas, you know, two, three hour drives, things like that. There's a push in the community for that. What, um, are you aware of that? Um, well, you're telling me that, but my focus has been on keeping people safe and obviously uh, working with the National Cabinet, Labor and Liberal. Uh, so if you want to express that, you express it. Well, I'm not expressing that view. I think it's too early to engage in long distance travel. And um, you, would be, you would be aware that in New Zealand, the health minister, David Clark, was demoted for traveling to the beach. In Scotland, the first chief health officer, Catherine Calderwood, Dr. Catherine Calderwood, was sacked for visiting her second home. In Queensland, the shadow police minister, Trevor Watt, resigned. Um, you'd know that your colleague, the Honorable Don Harwin, the former leader of the government and the Legislative Council, was also forced to resign for traveling to and from Sydney. And this morning, it's transpired that the Deputy Premier um, visited his second property two-hour drive away from his Queen Bean home, 125 kilometers. And at this morning's press conference, the Deputy Police Commissioner, Gary Warboys, said that he'd be investigating it. Do you think that the Deputy Premier should resign because Mr. Harwin resigned, the New Zealand Minister was demoted, the Chief Health Officer of Scotland, Shadow Minister in Queensland, Leader of the Government and the Legislative Council, and now we find the Deputy Premier who attacked Mr. Harwin on April the 9th and said he was bloody angry at the Minister traveling a shorter distance than he did. What is your response to the Deputy Premier? Well, the Deputy Premier hasn't asked me anything, so I don't have a response to the Deputy Premier. So you think it's acceptable, you think it's acceptable for the Deputy Premier to break public health orders and you travel to a second me. property? For you don't ask me a question, ask me the question. I mean, you just give it a very long... Question. Is it simple? Did the Deputy Premier break New South Wales law by going to his second property 125 kilometres away from the second home. Well, there are two aspects uh, there, Mr. Secord. Uh, one is that, um, first of all, I thought this committee was interested in looking at the public health safety. Uh, and the looking, public health order. And looking, and looking at the good work that's been done by public health and by the practitioners at the front line. I thought we were going to talk about that. But if you're in, more interested in actually leading off by saying you're not interested what did you say? You said you're interested in being bipartisan, but now you want to actually play politics. I'm not here to play politics, and I'm not going to engage in that. That's a matter before the police. Uh, Minister, this is about hypocrisy, and this is about your government's yours, approach. Yours. This is about your government's approach. This is about your government's approach. You ask the community to do our part. We've changed our behavior. We don't visit loved ones. We don't go see grandparents. However, the Deputy Premier thinks that it's okay to drive 125 kilometers to build a cubby house. That was his reason. He said it was to build a cubby house. Now, I don't see how building a cubby house is essential work. We are all not visiting elderly parents, elderly grandparents, but you have the Deputy Premier of New South Wales thinking that it's okay for him to break the law. Don't you think that he should be brought to account? Um, as I said, I'm here to answer questions about the community safety. 
and I'm not going to be drawn on that as an under investigation, apparently by the police, as you just told me. Well, well, Minister, well, Minister, well, Minister you can spend two hours asking. You can spend two hours asking about that, or you can ask for two hours about the sorts of issues that doctors and public health officials are taking to keep people safe. But, well, okay. but this goes to this goes to the approach of your government. We are all in this together. We are all doing our part, and we are not seeing loved ones. But the deputy premier of New South Wales thinks that he can travel around the state. This is the man who told people to stay out of rural well, New order. South Wales. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Khan. Look, the point of order is simply this: apart from that, uh, uh, the member is engaging in speeches as opposed to asking questions. The question has now been asked at least twice, perhaps three times, and answered in the way that the minister thinks appropriate. Now, I can only reinforce the position that the minister's put. We have precious time on a substantial subject. The member should move on to something of, of greater relevance to his war. Um, uh, I think there is. I think there is. Let me finish. I think there is some merit in, in the position you're putting, especially on the amount of precious time we have. Um, I think it's within the scope. Uh, but I, could, I, could I ask members to restrict their questioning to questioning? Um, I'll go back to the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. But Health Minister, don't you think it's hypocritical that on April the 9th, the Deputy Premier attacked the Arts Minister for breaking social distancing laws? Attacked... Mr. Sakoi, can I just say this? Government? You no, said... No, this on the 12th of March, you said, let me say from the outset that you have the Labor opposition in full bipartisan support as you work to protect our communities. I understood that I and the Chief Health Officer and the, Chief, and the Secretary of Health were here to answer questions about keeping the community safe, and you're only interested in playing politics. I will say this once only. I've answered the question, but the Chief Health Officer has given up two and a half hours of her time where she has been working anything up to 24 hours a day to actually keep people safe, and all you're interested in is politics. I'm very, very disappointed, and I don't intend to pursue it any further. Let's get to the facts. Um, Health Minister, is COVID-19 still rampant in New March nursing home? Um, I'll ask the Chief Health Officer to answer that question. So, Mr. Sacord, we have seen um, cases amongst healthcare workers which are under investigation. A number of those healthcare workers have acquired the infection is being investigated. A number of them were um, wearing full PPE, um, and so we're hope we're um, investigating whether there's any um, contacts amongst the residents that have been occurred through that process. The, there have been pleasingly no new cases amongst residents, but I want to stress that we are continuing to be incredibly vigilant about. Um, repeat assessment of residents in the facility. There has been strengthened infection control um, presence. Um, the minister announced on Saturday that we were screening, upping the systematic screening of the um, staff in the in the home um, when they are turning up for work. In addition to the already systems in place to to make sure there's no one um, no no staff member is working that hasn't been had access to recent testing. Um, so all of those measures have been put in place in relation to the aged care facility. It's obviously something we're watching very closely and um, we will continue to update um, both the residents and the families and the broader community um, with information as we get it on Thank our you. normal per class cycle. And I'll just add to that that um, of course, aged care facilities, uh, including New March, are uh, conducted by non-government organisations generally and are regulated by the federal government. And the Aged Care Safety and Quality Commission issued a statement yesterday indicating certain requirements for Angley Care to comply with. And those we managed through uh, in, a, in collaboration, I'm sure, between the Commission and Angley Care. And I also now, just remind... Yep, sorry, sorry, Minister. I was also going to say that let's not forget uh, that each of these individuals are people who are uh, living in their home, in their residence, and uh, have generally their own general practitioners um, who care for them and uh, amongst 
any decision making that occurs there for them, it will be between their family, their GP, although the GPs these days are not coming into the facility, they're doing it by telehealth. Um, so this, it's quite a complex situation. Uh, Minister, just to be clear, in correspondence with the opposition, your office confirmed that New South Wales Health is responsible for providing health-related services and support to residents at Newmarch. Are you now resigning from that position or do you accept that Sorry, it is the wrong Well, there's correspondence, correspondence, correspondence from, from your office to the Shadow from Health who? Minister. From whom? Well, I'm not going to name the individual, but one of your staff members. Well, I only have, I, I'm sure I, you can tell me, because uh, mention the first name. Uh, Sandy. Right, and what is actually said? It says here, New South Wales Health provides health-related services and support. And this is in the context of a query the opposition had raised with you. So I'm just interested in confirming that you accept that the health department is responsible for providing health-related services and support to people in Newmarch. Well, I would have thought with your experience, uh, Mr Searle, as a barrister, you would know the relationships between professionals and their clients and professionals yes. and their patients. Yes, and, I do. And, and accordingly, this question would, uh, I'm sure the answer to it would clarify what you already know, which is that when individuals move into a, when they're in their own home, start with that, when they're in their own home, at their house, they generally would have a general practitioner, a primary health care a practitioner looking after them. When they move into an aged care facility, then generally they would still, what they would normally do is ask, usually ask for their GP to look after them. And the GP does do that, and GPs generally make a practice of visiting their patients in their, either their own home or their home if it happens to be an aged care facility. Um, hang on, let me finish, please. So that still exists for quite a number of the residents there. But obviously, uh, when uh, things became challenging there in the early days, um, albeit that it's a, a federally run uh, or federally regula regulated aged care facility, and one that actually uh, has angry care as the NGO, then obviously New South Wales Health was, was uh, able to assist when they, for example, ran short of staff. That's not something that they would normally do. But New South Wales Health uh, offered to put in some nurses to assist when they had no staff, the staff uh, were unavailable. Um, but more importantly, in recent times, um, as it, uh, as it uh, became obvious there were other challenges, New South Wales Health has also offered additional services, uh, effectively to the federal government regulated body, uh, by putting in uh, infectious disease specialists, uh, geriatricians, and others to assist with the patients. Minister, um, now maybe Dr. Chen can confirm this. My understanding is that there have been 16 deaths at Newmarch and 68 COVID positive notifications. Is that correct? That's correct. That's at, that's at as at the reporting period. Yes, yeah. that's correct. Now, and the New South Wales Health has known of the presence of COVID for three weeks in that facility? I would have to go back to the first um, notification. Um, okay, when, that, when was that? Okay. I, I, I think you can take it as read. I think the, when was the first death at, um, or the, oh, the first case confirmed in a staff member was April the 11th. So almost a month, sorry, I stand corrected. So the first, so change, okay. So my question is, why did it take almost four weeks before Anglicare was given an ultimatum to fix it up by 5 p.m. today? Why did it take? I'm sorry. Four weeks. Well, that's not an issue for public health here in New South Wales. That's an issue for the federal government and what? for and the, and the commission. So, direct your questions to the commission. New South Wales Health has been helping a lot as it should do, um, but that's a entirely a question you should address to the commission. Didn't you? Don't you think that four weeks is a long time to give an aged care facility an ultimatum to clean up its act? Well, well, Didn't you think that you had a role to commission. step? Don't you think you have a role to step in? Or are you going to blame the federal government? So you've known about COVID the federal government for four weeks. For you, you and health ministry, you, your government and health have known about COVID in Newmarket for four weeks, and you did not. And an ultimatum was given 
for this afternoon. What, what you're saying is it's completely wrong. Shows a complete lack of understanding of anything to do with how the health system works, and shows again a remarkable interest in being political instead of actually caring about. Sure. Would you like to answer? Yes. Some degree, what is actually a political question with some substance. Perhaps if I could just, um, well, can you take short? Sure. Okay, sure. Dr. Chen, could you then take us through? why New South Wales Health did not intervene in that four-week period. Can you take me through the steps of why New South Wales Health and the government didn't intervene? Mr. Sakoa, the premise well, you're wrong. You're just plain wrong. wrong. And you're superficial and wrong. Sorry. The premise of that comment was perhaps, perhaps uh, if I just yes. work, work through the issues. So we were concerned, there was a concerned case on the 11th of the 4th, and the facility was then put into lockdown to external visitors and all residents were asked to isolate in their rooms. I think it's important um, for you to remember that the incubation period for the disease is 14 days. So there had been an individual in that facility who had introduced COVID into the facility and had worked during her infectious period, period which we take as two days prior to symptom onset. She reported working at Newmarch House on the 30th, the 1st, the 2nd, the fourth, the fifth, and the sixth. The, um, and then, um, if I could just perhaps go through this and then I'd be happy to take any questions. So, and then in regard to a clinical outreach team uh, led by an infectious disease physician, so this is an infectious disease physician from the PM um, Blue Mountains, a very experienced infectious disease physician who was actually involved and assisted in the management of the Dorothy Henderson Lodge outbreak um, was in place at Newmarch House from the 12th of the 4th. And can I just commend that clinician and acknowledge the key work? There was also infectious disease expertise from the district. They developed screening um, guidelines and an outbreak response. Um, details of the close contacts of the staff were provided and close contact tracing occurred and there was isolation of contacts with the case and a total of 35 staff members and 66 residents were identified as close contacts and required to self-isolate and monitor the symptoms. Um, progressively there was um, all symptomatic staff and residents are tested for COVID-19 and health screening including temperature check is conducted daily on all staff entering the facility. There was also clinical outreach team um, implemented um, screening where residents were swabbed every three days on average um, as an additional measure. So progressively um, a range of measures initially to look at the scope of the infection. So you can imagine that if um, an infectious person has worked in the facility for quite a long time, it's important that we map the understanding. There are challenges because of the 14 day incubation period. You do not know who is incubating the disease and who will over that 14 days develop symptoms. There has been, um, I think as we've evidenced in our public reporting, some concerns around the challenges of infection control in this facility. And all of the partners, including the Commonwealth and the state and Anglicare have been working together. I believe, and this is really a matter for the um, aged care commissioner, that the aged care commissioner had taken steps earlier to um, reinforce the management of the facility by um, providing some support from experienced team that worked at um, Dorothy Henderson Lodge to support the, um, the New March House. And then we continue um, on the weekend, I announced that there was a further reassessment on Friday of last week through um, senior staff at the Clinical Excellence Commission and um, then the minister, as I said, announced the swabbing of the um, staff, which did indicate and picked up some additional staff members. So why did it, sorry, can I just can I just stop you there? Why did it take so long? Sorry, why did it take you so long before testing of the staff occurred? Given that the first case was on the 11th of April, and let's not forget, after all of the Dorothy Henderson matters and the tragedies there, there were six deaths there and 18, 18 cases. Um, a month later it hits Newmarch and we've seen the tragedy unfold there. Why did it take so long for 
um, testing of the staff to, to occur? And secondly, why, and this is a question for you, Minister, why at any point have you decided not to exercise your powers under the Public Health Act to try and get the situation under control? So just to clarify, staff were, staff were tested um, earlier on, and that was the, certainly the, the advice provided. What we're doing is ensuring that um, we're repeating the testing of staff. So there was processing in place for, for staff to be screened and tested, um, but that's been strengthened um, to ensure that prior to their um, coming on shift, they were screened, that's been now that doesn't mean they actually had a COVID. Sorry, that doesn't mean sorry, that. Sorry, sorry, Penny. COVID sorry, test. sorry, Ms. Sharp. Ms. Sharp. First of all, can we allow the witness to answer? And secondly, the opposition's time has expired, so we'll allow this the witness to conclude, and then we'll move on to crossbench. So I can provide details to the committee offline about the number of staff that were screened earlier, but the staff have been getting screened throughout the process. This really was a further strengthening of the staff screening, whereby prior to going on shift. They were actually swabbed as they entered the facility. That was done on a couple of days, and then that would be regularly repeated in a sort of regular interval. Um, that um, now that that's that swabbing of all staff. So it's it's a reduced frequency of swabbing, and this has all been informed by the infectious disease specialist in consultation with other experts that have been that's involved. Medical, um, you and then just to be clear, also that. The um, Aspen Medical had also been providing um, medical um, and clinic nursing staff into the into the facility. And All right. Um, we, we probably will return to this in the next round of opposition questioning, but we now move to the crossbench. Uh, Ms. Famine. Thank you, Chair. Uh, morning, Minister. Morning, Dr. Chan. Morning, Ms. Cough. Good morning. Minister, you indicated you wanted to talk about staff on the front line and the great work they're doing. So are nurses and other frontline staff getting any additional allowances for the kind of dangerous conditions they're working in at the moment? Um, the nurses are paid as per the usual arrangements. I don't think there's really... No specific allowances, but we've provided additional support free parking and accommodation um, if necessary due to a lot of things, hours. So, okay, a lot of the things that um, that we've done are what, they, what were asked for, which is uh, some of the staff were really quite concerned that if it uh, did get ahead of steam up, as it obviously has in most other juris jurisdictions, the staff um, and the unions had asked for support in terms of accommodation nearby. So they were particularly concerned that uh, Perhaps they might not want to go home working uh, in a COVID uh, situation. Fortunately, not too many of them have had to be in that, although there have been a number. So the government moved and responded to that by putting in a substantial amount of money to get free accommodation for nurses and doctors and other staff, allied health staff, who might need it if they chose to do it. So that is there for them. In addition, there were steps taken to provide um, free car parking for uh, staff in the hospitals during the COVID crisis. We're trying to ease some of those uh, pressures on them. Have there been have there been any requests for additional allowances at all? Not That's to me. I don't know do. whether they've been made elsewhere. Yeah. I think uh, not. Not not that I know. I mean, I think the staff, health staff, actually don't work. They work because they care about patients. Um, I mean, we'd all like to get paid more, I suppose, but I haven't had any, because what they've been more concerned about is the issues I just talked about. But also, there's been a lot of work done. Uh, you, you would be aware, doubtless, that right across the country, in fact, this morning, our friendly, prime, uh, friendly um, president in the US had a, a lot of doctors uh, with him as he talked about uh, the challenges of PPE, uh, personal protective equipment in the United States. We've had the same sort of challenges here. So a lot of the staff that I've dealt with have been and most of them have my mobile, so they ring me and they've been concerned about uh, PPEs. So there's been a lot of work done by the government um, with non-government organisations, with the police, to procure additional um, additional PPE, but that's been a challenge because the supply lines have been uh, largely blocked off overseas. So that's been a challenge. But most of the conversations I've had with health staff have been around those sorts of issues, and none of them have actually raised the issue of asking for additional money from me anyway. 
Do you think so? I understand there's potentially a public sector wage freeze as part of this potentially in the next budget, but do you think nurses and other frontline staff should be exempt from any freeze on the 2.5% public sector wage increase? Um, I've seen reports of that, but I haven't been involved in any discussion, so I can't comment on any aspects of that. What, in your view, given you wanted to talk about the great work they're doing and how they are putting themselves out there for the nation, the community right now, they're not getting they, any they, uh, additional hours in terms of dangerous conditions. I, I, I would have expected a little better from you because you're just being political. How about you actually focus on the good work the doctors, nurses and others are doing and and we'll, I'll, I'll happily talk about that. I'm here to talk about the health portfolio. I'm not the treasurer. I'm not the premier. You direct those sorts of comments to them. But Minister, I can tell you that I'm yes, backing the staff and the I'm backing them 100% in every different way. Minister, with respect, though, the question is around additional allowances in relation to working in dangerous conditions, which many other workers in other um, sectors and industries receive. Uh, do you think they should be, uh, nurses and other frontline staff should be uh, in some staff, way compensated for working in dangerous conditions? Nursing staff and uh, doctors work in those sort of circumstances regularly, but they also are trained uh, with the use of appropriate protective equipment and they are regularly doing this sort of thing, not necessarily with COVID. But um, I don't think I've ever heard you raise that issue before. Now in the middle of the pandemic, you're raising one specific issue and asking me about issues that I know nothing about. I'm not going to be drawn on that issue. I'm here to talk about the health issues. Seriously, yes. the two and a half, I have the chief, I have the secretary and the chief health officer here, and so far all I've heard is politics from you and Mr. Mr. Stark. How about Mr. we stick with the issues? Minister, in relation to, you mentioned um, PPE. So is training in PPE a prerequisite for staff working in aged care facilities? That includes nurses. What type of training have they had both in PPE and um, infection control? Well, again, aged care facilities, you'd have to direct those questions to the, uh, to the aged care safety and quality commission, which is the federal commission or the federal government or Anglicare. We don't run that, any of those villages that have actually been under control. I can tell you though that the nursing staff who go in there from, if we have to back up and help, certainly have had training. Um, Dr. Chan, would you like to add anything to that? Uh, just, just to acknowledge the work of the Clinical Excellence Commission in, in providing a lot of resources that support um, training. And I do want to um, support you in the fact that um, appropriate infection control and PPE is going to be an important component of our response in a variety of settings. So just acknowledge the, the importance of that. Having said that, can I also say, uh, Kate, that one of the challenges, um, I was with, um, um, and I'll ask Dr. Chant in a second just to say a little bit more about this. PPE is not necessarily the absolute answer because uh, I did a press conference last week with uh, Dr. Catherine Pittman, who is a, um, an infectious diseases specialist, an epidemiologist, I think, but uh, from Westmead. And she was making the point in a meeting afterwards that uh, during um, SARS, um, when PPE was also obviously a, a very important aspect of management of the, uh, of the virus. But they did some um, follow-up studies and they found that uh, even the most highly trained people using PPE still do what you just did, which is touch your face. Um, and unfortunately, that happens anything up to a thousand times a day from people who are, the, who are normal like you. Um, and but with a PPE specialist, someone who's actually an infectious disease specialist, sure can still do it. And so you still get problems with people who are Minister, using it because they can I, untouch their face I without could, blaming anybody. Minister, I really do have to interrupt you. I have 10 minutes in this round and um, I'm aware of, uh, I'm just conscious that uh, you're kind of straying from the question I actually asked, which is you know, there are concerns obviously about, uh, um, we've already discussed that this morning in relation to aged care facilities. Um, the training, so what we have is very vulnerable people now in aged care facilities, but a lot of the staff working in there, not trained in terms of how to use PPE, or in fact, are they being trained now in terms of the COVID-19 infection control 
training? Is that going to occur uh, or well, I, occur? I, I think that's your assumption and, and I don't know. We don't specifically It's a question, by... today. it's not an assumption. It's a question to you. Or Dr. Chan. By or the federal government and Sorry, David, I'm just having trouble with feedback here. Can you, yeah, you have uh, well, problem? we can hear you now, Minister. I think you know, it's clear for you to provide your answer now. Um, Kate, the, the issues are that it is managed by any aged care facility. Most aged care facilities are managed by a non-government organisation and they do very good jobs in normal circumstances. But this is an unusual circumstance. And I think it's fair to say that a lot more training needs to be done um, in aged care facilities. I mean, half the people in, uh, in England who have died uh, have been in aged care facilities. So that tells you that they're particularly vulnerable population, anybody over the age of 70, anybody over the age of 50 with comorbidities is recognised as being particularly vulnerable to this particular virus. Okay, so one more question. No if to that, just one more question, if I may then. So it seems you seem to be indicating that there is a potential regulatory gap in relation to aged care facilities at the moment in relation to uh, ensuring that they have PPE tra uh, training and how to use PPE in terms of staff and also infection control. Couldn't this be the subject, therefore, of a public health order from you? What would you like me to order, Kate? <laughs> well, you tell me, but if you're indicating that okay, Kate, staff, I'll tell you I'll take staff, it down, I have. The reason why we are doing so well in New South Wales and Australia is because each of the state Labor and Liberal ministers who have worked together very collaboratively without politics have actually taken advice from their chief health officers and from their epidemiologists and from their uh, infectious diseases specialists. And that information has not been given to me that I should make an order about that. And I would have thought um, that that's uh, what you would agree to, that I should be taking advice from the uh, chief health officers and from the other specialists in the field. And I haven't received that advice. All right. I, that, that round of questioning um, has concluded. Minister, did I hear earlier you would seek to get some advice on that and, and provide the answer on notice? No. On that issue? All right. Well, then we'll hand over to uh, Mr. Borzak. Um, Robert. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, thanks very much for coming, uh, Minister Hazard, uh, Ms. Chant. Um, just a question to you, Ms. Chant. Um, has there been any shortage of PPE uh, at hospitals during this crisis? Um, the PPE supply, what we've seen through this um, event is a, um, a worldwide shortage of personal protective equipment. New South Wales Health has worked in a whole of government way to secure supplies <coughs> of PPE. There may have been circumstances, I'm not aware that there have been um, no absence of PPE available, but <coughs> I am aware of individual circumstances peripherally that where there have been um, potentially um, a clinician may have um, had to have gone through or seek, or seek it through another process as in terms of the, the just not being available where they are but in the hospital themselves there would have been um, appropriate equipment. So I think one of the key points there is as we've had to um, put in controls around um, securing the supplies of the PPE. There have been some administrative processes for staff to get access to them. We've um, identified and requested districts um, um, communicate effectively to their staff about the processes for accessing PPE if um, there is a shortage in a particular area, how they rapidly can address that within the normal operational management. But I just do want to acknowledge the work of HealthShare our districts, the whole of government approach to securing PPE because we're certainly in a much more um, comfortable position um, with our forward planning. So I take it as a qualified yes. Um, I have any qualified health yes. That... Sorry, you agree with that? A qualified yes. Okay, yes, thank I you. do agree with that. Have any health staff at the front line been put at risk due to the shortages of PPE? I would be happy to investigate. In the, in the context of COVID, you mean? In the context of Sorry? dealing with a COVID patient? Sorry, are you saying in the context of dealing with a COVID patient? Is that what you're saying? 
Well, uh, I've, I've been listening to you saying all morning, Ms. Minister Hazard, that that's why we're here to talk about. So why would you interfere with my questioning of Ms. Chant? Well, I think we can assume, sorry, Minister, I think we can assume that the questioning in, in this inquiry is about the COVID-related matter, unless well, it's otherwise been, expressly there has been said. No, I mean, Dr. Chant can answer as she wishes, but I'm just telling you that it has not been drawn to my attention at any point that any, any uh, practitioner at the front line has not, of, of dealing with COVID patients, has not had uh, PPE. But of course, as Dr. Chan has said, there have been individual uh, hospitals in individual areas where you might find a doctor in a non-COVID patient, a non-COVID ward has been told to be careful using PPE, and that's been a worldwide phenomenon. So it's not, uh, not something that's unique. And I think the issue is everybody's been fearful. Everybody's been fearful, very fearful, and so. There have been um, extended usages of PPE in some circumstances where hospital management have had to talk to their staff about just correct use of PPE and considered use of PPE. Um, thank, I thought that I thank that question. My, my I question I again. That question is yeah, sorry, Robert, we're getting a little bit of a delay between this question and answer. I think Dr. Chant has a little more to add, so we'll go back to you, Dr. Chant. I suppose in responding to your um, your question, I would say that New South Wales Health takes any um, infection of other healthcare workers, be that in the private sector, the public sector, um, very seriously. And we've set up processes to ensure that cases of infection amongst healthcare workers are investigated. Um, and ensuring that we learn and understand any issues that could have prevented that infection. So just to say that is our utmost concern in terms of um, healthcare workers, and that applies to other categories, but we are setting up particular processes to look at healthcare worker exposures. Okay, thank you. So you are aware, you are aware of the fact that there are potential risks for frontline health care workers because of the situation with PPE shortages from time to time. That's what you're saying. Yes? Uh, I'm saying that healthcare workers are at risk of infection for a variety of reasons, including um, the fact that of the challenges um, in um, managing patients where, for instance, um, a patient who is confused or um, may may actually dislodge the person's um, PPE. So there are a number of issues. We also want to learn um, it, it, what are the sort of aspects of perhaps um, we, we, we need to learn and investigate where the healthcare workers have acquired it in order to understand whether it's perhaps where they haven't seen risk and not been wearing PPE or whether it is because, as I said, very incidental things or interactions with patients can lead to um, the PPE not be effective, for instance, in the cases where it's dislodged. And then we need to draw learnings from that. For instance, um, do we need additional support when people are helping with um, patients that might have um, cognitive impairment? We need to, to take all of these incidents where healthcare workers have acquired infection potentially in a healthcare setting and ensure that we rapidly learn any lessons. There are national um, guidance documents in relation to personal protective equipment, and that's developed through the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee. And there is also guidance documents for managing outbreaks in aged care facilities. Obviously, those guidelines are very much uh, a living document in the sense that any new information, and we actually have gathered much information about COVID in the journey from where we were back when we first saw our first cases to where we are now. We, we, our knowledge has grown massively, and we will need to update those documents and um, regularly with any new learnings. Thank, thank you, Ms. Chant. Uh, are you aware of frontline staff, health staff, having to purchase their own PPE? due to shortages? I um, am not aware that, uh, I suppose I'd full stop, I would be saying that um, the information provided to me is that we have adequate supplies of appropriate PPE 
I would be very happy to follow up any concerns um, by any health staff member employed by New South Wales Health and we would take those matters with the utmost of seriousness because, as I said, it is imperative that throughout this response we protect, do all we can to protect healthcare workers. You're saying you've had no complaints from staff or no one in your who works for you has had complaints from staff that they've had to go out and purchase their own PPE equipment because of shortages? There are many people, including, um, I'm not saying I have not, I am personally not aware of the complaint. Um, it may be in my email or I may, but I'm not personally aware that someone said they've felt the need to buy their PPE. I'm not saying that that hasn't occurred, but what I would like to say is that I would urge for us to reach out to that individual to ensure that they're very clear about how they can access PPE to protect themselves through New South Wales Health because the updates I've got is we have got adequate supply of essential PPE and um, I, but I do want to make sure that any healthcare worker knows who to escalate any concerns to in their organisation and I, and I um, would appreciate the knowledge of that being brought to anyone's attention. It can be done anonymously, but it, it signals the fact that there must be a communication gap and we need to work harder at um, advising healthcare workers about how to escalate concerns in their local health district or their facility. Um, how many frontline staff have been infected and where has this occurred? So I would, um, if you just give me a moment, I can find the data on healthcare workers. We update that weekly. It might just take a moment, but I will get that information for you. And as I said, um, the information um, in any circumstance, healthcare workers may have acquired the infection through a variety of sources. So for instance, um, we know a significant proportion of our healthcare workers have acquired the infection in um, through the overseas travel. Um, then there is their community exposures, but then there is the healthcare worker healthcare exposures. Currently, we are um, having a process where we're um, having an expert panel review all of those exposures to ensure that we consistently clarify those mm. exposure sources. But I will be able to provide. Um, perhaps if you move on to the next question, I will brought, bring up the healthcare worker data and be able to answer well, that. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Robert, that this, data, this, by the way, this, is this. published. That, that data is published uh, publicly once a week. All right. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chan, when that data comes available, you know, please feel free to, um, to, to intervene and tell us. But, Robert, this round has, has concluded. We'll move back to the opposition. Thank you. Um, Minister, it's the case that the two worst outbreaks um, the, of cases that have led to death um, in New, are in New South Wales, another Ruby Princess and Newmarch. Isn't that, isn't that correct? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So I'm just I'm just making the point that of the, of the outbreaks um, across across Australia that the two and the two worst in New South Wales are, are the Ruby Princess and Newmarch. I, th I think that's right, New South Wales, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, the reality is in the New South Wales that 33 of the 46 deaths that we've had, that's 71% of them, are from either aged care facilities or the Ruby Princess. Yes, I, I assume you, that's you, right. You, ac you, accept, you accept that, yeah. Yeah, no, no. I'm not trying to be tricky about it. I'm just, I'm, I'm concerned. I mean, New South Wales has had a very good... Um, you know, proportionately, you know, if we, if we measure ourselves, particularly against overseas, we've had a very good response. But the two areas where we've had such a significant and tragic um, outcome has been the result of serious problems within bureaucratic systems and decision making, both at the Ruby Princess and at the aged care level. And I'm and I'm wanting to know, um, you know, given given what we knew about the Ruby Princess, and I'm not planning on getting into what the inquiry is dealing with, but particularly you, Marge, after the tragedy at Dorothy Henderson, why New South Wales has been so unwilling to um, use the levers that you've got through the Public Health Act to be more involved than you have? In what? In what? Well, Minister, well, well, 
Well, Minister, I, I, want, I want to understand. I mean, the, the cases at Dorothy Henderson were a month beforehand. It, every, it was moving very quickly. People were trying to understand what was going on. Yet we have the first you know, official case at Newmarch on the 11th of April. We then find that we've got subsequently secondary infections coming through there. Um, at every time you've tried to bat it back to the Commonwealth, um, but surely the issue around the actual public health outcomes and the powers that you have under the Public Health Act was something that you could have you could have chosen to step in and do more. And I'm wanting to know why you didn't do that. I'm asking you, what did you want me to do this morning? Well, well, Minister, um, you left it 22 days between the first infection at Newmarch being detected and the institution of daily testing for the Newmarch staff. You could have used the Public Health Act to require them to institute daily testing much earlier, and you didn't. That was a conscious choice by you. Why did you not act earlier? Um, you know what? I've seen your press releases, the last press releases. Fortuitously, other Labor um, parties around the country haven't behaved like you have. You have been extremely political and not actually sought to really do what you said you no, wanted no, to do. No, no, Minister, I've asked you a question about no, why no, you're not answering the question. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Sirland, Minister. Uh, I think the Minister is answering. I think we'd love the answers to be directly relevant to the question, Minister, but we can't talk over each other. We'll have to let the Minister conclude. And once he's finished, I can, ask, I can answer the way as I wish to answer. Um, yes, you said you'd be bipartisan, yes. and you haven't taken that same view. In fact, most of the press releases you've issued have been, to say the least, uh, with scant understanding of anything to do with the health system or the or the complexity of dealing with this virus. Um, quite quite scant, actually. And so the advice that any any uh, minister right around the country in Labor or Liberal jurisdictions takes is on the on the advice of their chief health officers and other frontline health staff. Everything I've done has been on that basis. Now. In order to give you, rather than your political opportunism, I'll get some substantive responses from uh, Dr. Chan as to the history. Dr. Chan. Um, I just want to clarify the question from Ms. Sharp. Um, just in relation to the Ruby Princess, um, I think the assertion that the deaths on board the ship were related to the decision to disembark the ship. Um, could I just? Is that the assertion there? Because I, I just wanted that to. Might be the I just wanted to clarify that the inspection of those individuals who acquired the passengers of the Ruby Princess acquired their infection whilst on the Ruby Princess. The people, the decision around disembarkation, which is the subject of the commission's of finding, and he's also looking at the, presumably the issues as well as the acquisition on the cruise ship. But the issues around the disembarkation relate to secondary cases where those individuals who disembarked could have passed the infection on more broadly. But the deaths associated with the Ruby Princess, the people that developed those illnesses acquired that disease on infection on the Ruby Princess. So I just wanted to clarify that point, but I understand the Commission will be and are pleased to engage in the commission led by um, Brett Walker um, into that matter, as um, Health Always' position is that we want to learn and um, from any um, of our decisions and have them openly and transparently reviewed. Just in terms of the Newmarch, Newmarch cluster, perhaps if I just indicate that screening of staff and testing of staff occurred throughout the um, response. So, for instance, on there was a staff member on the 10th of the 4th that was identified. There was a staff member on the 12th of the 4th. There was a staff. There were um, four staff <coughs> identified on the 13th of the 4th, and there were um, four staff identified on the 14th of the 4th, and there were an additional three staff identified on the 17th of the 4th. There was one staff member. Thank you, Do Dr. Chan. Dr. Chan, thank you. That's actually very good. But providing in, in that format, it's actually very hard for us to understand. Would you be able to provide to the committee? I'm particularly interested in the testing regime. So the difference between staff that was screened, and then the staff that were tested, and then the staff that were staff and the, and um, the residents who were then proved positive. You're able to. I assume you've got that with you. I don't need you to read it out now, but I'd really appreciate it getting it in that format because I think the inter 
the interchange um, between the use of screening and testing and, posit and, and when people are found positive actually makes it difficult to understand exactly what the regime was in place there, and that's what we're seeking to understand. We'd certainly be happy to drive back to that money. Um, uh, Dr. Chance, Dr. Chance, if taking aside the Ruby Princess and Newmarch and Dorothy Henderson, it would, it would be safe to say that New South Wales would be leading the world in responding to COVID right. if we had, if New South Wales health and the government's handling hadn't been bungled. We'd be leading the world. Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. So if you want to ask a simple question rather than a loaded question, then Dr. Chan will answer the health question. If you don't ask a politically loaded question, then no, I'll answer the question. Okay. Is, okay. Mr. Your, Mr. If so you want substance, re ask the substance. Don't I come out with political that. rubbish. I will rephrase that. Taking aside Newmarch, Dorothy Henderson, and the Ruby Princess, would the figures in New South Wales be the best in the world? The current figures in New South Wales reflect that community transmission of COVID-19 are at low levels. I'm very pleased with the high rates of testing <laughs> and I'm very pleased with the, um, the fact that we are only encountering a small number of locally acquired. It's going to be important that we're very vigilant in those regards. Can I also indicate some concepts of disease control which might be useful for members um, to reflect upon? When we, um, the Dorothy, uh, when, what we've learned about aged care outbreaks is um, when we have um, the introduction of disease into an aged care facility, if we, prevention is the best. So, for instance, having incredibly high vigilance amongst the staff um, and ensuring that they um, do not attend when they have the most minimal of symptoms is the key because once we get um, the infection, as you can see, at a herd in settings oh, where you have Dr. close Chant, contact. Dr. Dr. Chant, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm mindful of time. We have very little time. I would like to know in context, it's a very simple question. So putting aside Dorothy Henderson, Newmarch, and Ruby Princess, wouldn't we be leading the world? I'm just telling you here now. I'm but, not asking. Uh, I'm not. A, I'm asking you. Uh, well, well I think you've asked the question. I think you've asked. We are. This, we are actually. Please, 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 we are. Stop. Our rate. Our rate is actually uh, better than Japan's, which is out of 128 million people, 0. 0.00039, I think, of cases, and ours is 0. 0.00035. So, and I actually think instead of attacking Dr. Chant and the health system for their an amazing amount of work they've done, you'd be better off asking the facts. So, just remind you. Uh, Mr. Sikor, that she and I have now done three separate uh, webinars and not once have you asked a question in any of those webinars, probably because that was on substance rather than politics. Uh, well, well, Minister, there, yeah. sorry, Chair, can, can I just, can I just, I wish to. Sorry, she should be sorry. actually doing the work looking after patients, not looking after politics. Hey. All right, no, can no, we, no, 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 Penny, 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 just I wait. Can, can we try and have... Can we try and have the opposition ask one question at a time? Um, so I'd ask, yeah, and one opposition member at the time. So um, who wishes to ask the next question? I'm going, to ask the, well, I'm going to ask the next question. And I would make the point, Minister, that Parliament is currently not sitting. This committee exists so that we can ask questions um, about the response to what has happened. No one is trying to attack your officers. We're trying to ask questions and we're asking questions on behalf of particularly families and friends and others who have died during this during this pandemic through errors that have been made that we're still coming to grips with and we're trying to understand that this is not a political play this is a legitimate this is a legitimate question these are legitimate questions that we're entitled to ask you i challenge the premise of your question now through mistakes that have been made who by and by what the matters around the Ruby Princess, Ruby Princess are being looked at by the Commission of Inquiry, and the matters in relation to the other matter that you've raised are also a subject of an investigation by age quality, but you have no basis whatsoever. There are thousands of people, tens of thousands of people who have died across the world. New South Wales Health has done an extraordinary job, the frontline staff, the public health staff, and the entire system. And all I'm hearing is uh, deprecatory comments 
loaded political questions. This shouldn't be about a political exercise. If it were, then you could direct them to me and not to the Chief Health Officer and the Secretary. All right. Well, we are, actually, we are actually asking you. Thank you, Minister. I've actually got a Thank question. You, Minister. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Sharp. Let's, let's return to questions. I've got a question. Um, and Thank see if we can you. elicit some information. I've got a very specific question, which is that I want to understand how staff from Aspen, who had been working on the Ruby Princess, were allowed to walk into the New March facility, and and, and what the what were the protocols that allowed them to do that, and what was the testing and street and screening that was placed upon those those staff? Again, the question shows a profound lack of understanding about the New South Wales public health system. Oh, so if you, if, look, Minister, if you wanted to say this has got nothing to do with you and not your problem and put it all on someone else, you're able to do that. I'm giving you I the opportunity to actually to explain to the committee and the people of New South Wales. Let's remember that 96 per cent of the aged care cases are in New South Wales. These are New South Wales residents have a point and that we are allowed to ask questions on their behalf. I'm not arguing all the right. trust. I'm, I'm going, going to, to go to Ms. I'm going to go was. to Ms. Ward on a point of order. Um, Ms. Ward. Thank you, Chair. I've been silent, but um, I have observed that um, questioning now appears to be deteriorating into a speech that the Minister was attempting to answer the question and was barely through his first sentence before he was interrupted with a suggested answer um, by the Honourable Member. I just ask that we um, bring it back to the questioning and allow the Minister to provide his answer in the way in which he chooses. Yeah, well, I think it's a good observation that if we could not talk across each other, this will go uh, much more smoothly. I think there is a substantive question on the table, Minister, about uh, screening for Aspen workers between the Ruby Princess and the New March um, nursing home. And maybe we could just come back to addressing that those those factual inquiries. Aspen was placed. Aspen Medical was placed the point, the by the federal government, as it was on the uh, on the Ruby Princess. Um, the New South Wales Health uh, has no control over those matters, but I will ask Dr Chant, as a secondary, um, from secondary knowledge on anything that can contribute to assist Ms Sharp, as she obviously would prefer to be in the federal parliament asking federal questions. But Dr. Uh, Chant, hang on, but before no, Dr Chant goes there, I mean, what I'm seeking is actually New South Wales's role in the coordination of this entire response. I'm not. Yes. Um, I, I, yes, to I, be think, clear, I think that's understood, Ms Sharp. To be clear, I think that's yes. understood. So this is not I, and a I think it's, I think Dr. Chant, I, I think it's understood the questions here about the role of New South Wales Health and New Correct. South Wales Health officials. And Dr. Correct. Chant, if you could answer in that context, it would be of great assistance. So in, rela in regard to the um, movement of health staff, so perhaps I'll answer that initial supposition, is that the Aspen um, would have employed those nurses and been requested to provide nurses, they would have provided nurses. There is no barrier to healthcare staff that have been working with COVID positive um, cases in our healthcare system attending other places, provided that they have not been uh, a breach in their infection um, PPE. The Aspen staff would have been would have been clearly in providing um, services in the Ruby Princess setting, knowing that that was outbreak. They were wearing. Um, infectious um, PPE, and there was actually 30 infection control nurses from Aspen deployed to ensure that the Ruby Princess um, crew um, situation was being managed um, with the utmost attention to infection control. So that's all I can comment about the fact that healthcare workers that are working in areas where, for instance, ED, etc., can go and work in another area. The only time that they wouldn't be is where they were. Um, in um, in um, infection control, if they had um, attended a COVID positive um, patient. In terms, so I hope that answers the question just about that Aspen aspect. Um, just a, just a quick follow up. I mean, I know that I just think that most people, and myself included in this, would uh, was very concerned to hear that people had basically been on a boat that we know that was significantly. Um, uh, compromised in relation to the virus, were able so quickly to just move across. I do accept that, you know, within hospitals, that that's that's quite a standard thing, as people are working with COVID patients. But it's the transfer of from the two sites, um, and I still have to, I have to say after your answer, Dr. Chan, I'm still unclear about what does New South Wales really just have no role in that. That basically the the federal government informs us of that, and we just sort of 
go yes or no? I mean, is there any point at which you seek to intervene to get a better outcome if you're at all concerned about what's yeah. going on? Um, look, the answer there, Penny, is that as much as the answer is federal government regulate the body. Anglicare has a role, or whichever NGO is managing it has a role. If the patients don't have their own GPs for some reason, which in this case they still do have in many cases, but they're doing it by telehealth, if there are broader issues that are come up, so for example, with that with that situation, when the first worker was identified, the lady who um, was first identified, there are a whole series of people who were taken offline because they were working in there and they were contacts of her. Some were, some were obviously the patients who had contacts, but there were a whole lot of workers. So that did isolation. Now we know we've had that happening since, uh, what, since January, early February, that we've, everybody's learned what isolation means. So a lot of people were taken offline. Um, in the short term, New South Wales Health offered some help, but it's not their role, but they offered help by putting some nursing staff in there. And then the federal government with Anglicare worked together and came up with the suggestion that obviously, I mean, I wasn't party to the discussion, so I don't know precisely, but I'm hypothesizing that they suggested that we could possibly get, they could possibly get Aspen Medical to provide staff. At that point, Aspen Medical did precisely that. And Aspen had been working um, in there for all that time. When, when New South Wales Health came in, it was more, normally a GP would refer, in, some, in other circumstances, you'd refer, you would have been to a specialist, but you know that specialists you only see normally when a GP has referred you to it. In this case, what New South Wales Health said was, look, we're quite happy to help and get in there with some of the specialists um, if you really need us. And we thought they obviously needed us, so we did that. Oh. Sorry, Penny, I saw you say something, but I couldn't hear what you were saying. So look, I would have to ascertain the fact that Aspen would have been asked to provide nursing staff. We would not have been told where those nursing staff were sourced. We, we would be more um, concerned about the quali qualifications and, and others. But if you have any information that um, I think the concern you've got or assertion you're making that they somehow introduced this virus into the facility, I'd be happy to follow that up. But Aspen, I'm not sure, would have actually mentioned exactly being concerned because their staff would have been following, Aspen would have been responsible for ensuring their staff were wearing appropriate PPE, they were in a known COVID positive and then they would have been um, deployed in accordance with the need. So sure, but with all those reassurances, that, with all those reassurances, let's remember one of the Aspen staff has been stood down for failure to use proper PPE. But, but hang on, hang on, let's not go blaming staff. You're, you're making, you want to blame everybody at the moment. I'm not blaming, I'm not blame. blaming the staff at all, the staff. staff. I'm not staff. blaming the staff at all. I'm blaming, I'm interested in you the role blame. of New South Wales Health in containing an outbreak. The most, you know, 96% right. of cases in, New, oh, in Penny, across Australia, Australia are in our area. But Penny, 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 you made an observation about a breach of PPE, and I think it's fair that the Minister or Dr Chant responds to the proposition about a breach of PPE, if they choose to. So uh, I am aware peripherally that Aspen has taken action in relation to that. I'm aware that any positive person detected will have been removed from the facility and assessment of close contacts will have occurred. And even assessment of close contacts take takes into account whether people are wearing appropriate PPE at the time. I just really want to put on the record again that the, pe the people, the passengers on the Ruby Princess acquired their infection on board the ship. In terms of the disease onset, as I mentioned to you, is 14 days. So a number of them were obviously developing the symptoms towards right at the end of the cruise following when they dis disembarked and on the subsequent days. All of those infections occurred through their exposure to the, on, their exposures on the cruise ship. So nothing that New South Wales Health could have done could have prevented those cases. What we're clearly responsible for is any onward transmission if there was an error in the, dis in, in the, in the decision making around disembarkation. Noting also that all of the people on the Ruby Princess 
were going home and under directions of border force to self-isolate for 14 days. So yes, um, it is important to look at the global numbers, but also if people are self-isolating in home, that again project, protects the risk of transmission onward. I can just say that we understand that aged care facilities are going to be one of the most important settings for our public health response. I was personally involved in the Dorothy Henderson um, response um, and learned a lot very quickly. And we've learned progressively about um, our responses. And some of the, and that will be incorporated into the national guidance for investigation and management of um, outbreaks. We're learning more about um, the benefits of widespread testing, symptomatic and asymptomatic, which was used early on in this. And that was a learning from the Dorothy Henderson, plus also some of the international literature. We still, um, there is still much for us to learn about this, but aged care settings are certainly on, um, are a key priority for us. And we, we are working closely with the Commonwealth in learning all we can about steps we need to take in, in, in place. And we've got prevention as in terms of really upping the screening. And to be fair, people have seen COVID as a very serious illness. They've seen pictures of people in ventilators and people pre, um, with very severe illness. And, and what we're now saying is, and we've been saying this along, all along, but even more acutely now, we're aware that for some people, you can have the minimalist of symptoms. And we're also recognising in some high-risk settings that asymptomatic transmission, asymptomatic carriage may be there. There's still a lot to know about uh, transmission risk in asymptomatic, and there's also, uh, even in the pre-symptomatic period, there's much more for us to, to learn. But what we know is that preventing um, COVID getting into aged care facilities is the key and um, having a quite coordinated um, response. So I just want to reassure the committee that aged care, we have recognised the need to work across all agencies um, and cooperatively in our response to aged care facilities. Thanks, Dr Chan. We're going to move to uh, Ms Salmon now. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Minister, um, continuing on from what Dr Chant just said in relation to working with uh, aged care, which was um, very good to hear, I'm on the, looking at the New South Wales Health website at the moment and I can see that there's very good directions there for uh, New South Wales Health staff in relation to PPE. There's lots of... Um, uh, guidance, there's videos, there's also um, directives in terms of when to wear PPE as prescribed in certain guidelines. Can I ask whether New South Wales Health or whether you now going forward will ensure that this also applies to aged care workers? Aged care, again, is federal, but the federal government has all that up on their website for all their staff, their federal health staff, and federal aged care staff. So it's being done. Is it exactly the same? Is it, is it uh, standard uh, across okay, the board okay, now? Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, I don't know that. But I mean, uh, the, uh, if the federal government has put up those, those things, I think, <clears throat> I'm not quite sure the point you're making, but there's been a lot of work done, um, certainly in the state uh, situation in the last now seven or eight weeks to educate frontline staff about the correct use of PPE. Um, there were, at a time, this has all been done, the whole thing has been a, a progression of incredible speed uh, to try and make sure that at a time when we were seeing literally the world collapse around us to keep New South Wales, indeed keep Australia safe. But health staff like you and I were seeing what was happening overseas and they were really worried. Sure. And the normal PPE, the normal PPE that was available was there, but the worries were that in terms of our forward um, planning, uh, our mapping, we were seeing that if we did end up not holding this as we want to do, we could have, have had a massive curve, a massive increase that would have gone beyond um, the uh, beyond the capacity of our ICUs. The ICUs are not just the physical facilities; it's the staff, 
It's the PPE. It's all of the training that's necessary. And I think it's fair to say that everybody was scared, everybody, including those frontline staff. So some frontline staff uh, were using PPE in a way that wasn't uh, yes. absolutely necessary. They were using it when it wasn't absolutely necessary. And so the, the limited amount of PPE that was available was being worn and, if you like, overused. So there's been a lot of emphasis both at the federal level and the state level, um, and all other states and territories doing the same thing, um, all the Labor and Liberal states have been doing exactly the same thing, trying to make sure that frontline staff are well educated through various training modules about when to wear PPE, what Thank to you. wear, and how Minister, to do that. The result of that Minister, is very now. Thank you, Minister. I have 10 minutes. Sure, finish, Kate. You asked a question. I'm allowed to finish. Let, yes. If you're interested in the answer, then I'll give it to you. Minister, you also are taking well, well, up. Well, um, Ms. Salmon, I, I think we'll let the. I think the minister was drawing to a conclusion. I, I think if everyone could be mindful, we have a limited amount of time, Minister. But um, obviously, you've got the right to, to finish your answer. Thank you. And I'm answering in a substantive way on the issue. What, yes, I was yeah, about, <laughs> what I was about to finish and say was that PPE is a result. We're now seeing initial signs that less PPE is actually being used because staff are being given that additional education. So the fear factor is dropping, particularly as they know that there's more, more, more and more PPE available through the various uh, capacities that each of our state and territory governments have done and the federal government. They've all been working flat out on this. So I think we're seeing less. So what is actually the issue then, Kate, beyond that that you, you need to be answered? So the question, thank you, Minister. The question is in relation to ensuring that all staff on the front line who are working in situations with COVID-19 that they have the same instructions in relation to wearing PPE. So I had a quick look on the federal aged care website. It seems to be a guidance, not an instruction. On the New South Wales Health website, it says that uh, where safe work, working practices confirm PPE uh, is required for the protection of staff due to COVID-19 in all circumstances, staff are to wear prescribed PPE as instructed, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't think that's the case in aged care, is it? No, I mean that's Dr. Chancellor, yeah. if you can. Sorry, if I'm just looking on a website and I'm happy to provide the link, it's um, PPE should be worn when caring for someone with a confirmed or suspected um, COVID case. Wear a gown, mask, protective eyewear, gloves. Remove the PPE before exiting the room or the person's home. It gives guidance on the use of um, PPE. It gives a video. It also says that aged care providers can request PPE of the Commonwealth, um, and the department will assess request and will um, will consider that. So I think that the Department of Health is working to ensure supply of masks and other PPE um, for the aged care sector. So I'd be happy to do do that. But the same. Um, PPE would be required, that is, that for our staff, as required by aged care workers and, a, and, and health care staff when they're in those settings. So, the, the, yes, thank you. I, I do see that it says PPE should be worn. Um, I think there is a difference that um, I'm sure you're aware, Minister, with should be worn as opposed to in all circumstances staff are too. So, anyway, let's move. Let's. Uh, move on. Um, I have a question in relation to the growth factor uh, of the virus. So we're aiming for one or below. Is that correct, Minister? I'm sorry. Can I say that again? Sorry. The growth Could factor of the virus, we're aiming for one or below. That's correct. Oh, you're talking about the R factor, the R naught factor. Yep, yep, I'll ask right. Dr. If you ask about the R naught factor, then I'll ask Dr. Chan. Yeah, that's right. That. Is that what you're asking about, the R0 factor? Yes, not? it is. Thanks, Dr. Chant. Yep. Okay, so the, the R0, at the moment we are attempting to suppress the virus, and obviously, ideally, we would get to beneath an R0 of no, beneath one or an effective R0. However, as we um, release restrictions, we're likely to see some increase in cases, so that that's a balancing act of trying to keep the R0 as low as possible, um, balancing the fact that as we resume normal activities, with um, there are health disbenefits from unemployment, there's health disbenefits from 
not having children at school, there are multiple groups. So as we go through this, we will be using um, public health measures, um, including our contact tracing and our case finding with our high rates of testing, trying to continue that, and also our social distancing and our public health measures. And this will be finely calibrated as we're going forward to get that optimum balance between disease control and lowering that effective R naught as low as we can with some of those other um, social and economic um, imperatives which are also linked to health and wellbeing of the community. Thank you, Dr Chan. So what are the markers, if you like, that the government is using in terms of, um, in terms of uh, easing restrictions in relation to the growth rate? So at the moment, I understand it's increasing a little bit now. It's 1.05. I think it was 1.04 a day or two ago. So it's, it's certainly on the increase, yet there's talk about easing restrictions. So what marker in terms of that growth rate is the government focused on? Can I, um, I, can I, I start by just I, saying, hang on, Dr Chan can answer the medical stuff. Can I just answer first of all by saying there is a, a drive to try and make sure there's a balance here because there are mental health issues and economic issues interconnected. So it's not just the virus per se, it's the virus and its interconnection with the entire community and how the rest of the community will or won't operate. So the AHPPC, being the health officers, make their recommendations to the National Cabinet, which consists of Labor and Liberal uh, uh, first uh, leaders, leaders and uh, first ministers, and they then make recommendations back to each individual state and territory. Dr Chan, would you like to add to that? Um, yes, but I mean, would you be able to indicate what your source of that R naught value of 1.05, I think you indicated, or this what was, was the uh, This is ABC. This is ABC from uh, yesterday, updated about an hour ago. What's the ABC what's, source? What's the source of that? You'd be surprised to know sometimes the media <laughs> say things which aren't actually accurate. Well, if you well, could perhaps, perhaps, Dr. Chan, perhaps, Sorry, Dr. Chan, perhaps, Dr. Chan, if you have some, um, some other, some other okay. numbers, so, please give us those numbers. So, look, we have been looking at the modelling um, data, but in this current situation of low levels, the modellers have to actually use different techniques, and there are wide confidence intervals. Um, the data I saw yesterday had wide confidence intervals, but it looked like our R naught was beneath one for a little period of time, um, or currently beneath an R naught. Um, so, but I think that I'll answer the question from the point of view of the things that we need to give us confidence that our R naught is low. And I think we we have to be a little bit careful about too much precision about the R naught. What we will, what we need to have is high rates of testing. Because as you can see, and that includes accessing vulnerable people, because what you can see is occurring in Singapore. Singapore um, had uh, the first wave, which they managed well, but then once it got into their um, workers, their foreign workers, they had outbreaks which they missed. So for us, what we're focusing on is making sure we've got higher testing rates overall, but making sure also that the vulnerable, we've got pro, um, a ways of reaching the vulnerable, making sure that we've got our drug and alcohol, our homeless, we've got testing in those populations because we don't want outbreaks in those areas where potentially people are not um, able to access or, or there may be barriers to accessing in the traditional way. So I need high rates of testing, but I also need it to be statewide and I need it to also be across vulnerable, all of our vulnerable groups. The next bit is the locally acquired. So for me, I'm not concerned by cases that are occurring in our hotel. And this is why overseas cases which are isolating don't, even though they might add to our numbers, and even as we repatriate a large numbers of Australians from overseas, the fact that cases occur in that and increase our numbers does not mean that we have lost control. It means that we have case finding and they've been quarantined for that 14 weeks. 14 days in our facilities. The ones that cause me concern is where I've got um, cases emerging that are not linked to clusters. So where I don't know the source of the infection, it means I've missed the index case, I've potentially missed many other cases, and then with using this detective work, 
to go back and find out was there a point source and were there a couple of where was the index case for that person and did that index case infect others? The aim is to use our public health contact tracing to block those transmission routes. The other thing I need to know is that I've got public health capabilities to be doing that contact tracing um, in terms of responding to that. So, um, Ms. Furman, that sort of is, whilst we rely on the modelling, in these very low prevalence, low incidence, um, some of the modelling is um, more challenging and has very wide confidence intervals. What I need to be satisfied is I've got high testing rates and I'm not finding much disease, but I need to know that that testing is reaching all members of the community. In other words, because we're doing really well, it makes it very difficult hmm. to actually do the modelling because we don't have the stats like America or like um, Italy or what have you. And we've had to rely on some of our modelling in the early days on some of those overseas jurisdictions. So we are doing so well, and that then makes it a little challenging to know. Uh, I would also say that we also look at a lot of, a number of other indicators, which, and I'm pleased to say how effectively whole of government is working in terms of things like transport data, um, education attendance data, um, Google mobility data, all of that sort of data, which gives us some indication. But again, it has to be applied with a lens because people can move about if they move about safely. It's just, um, but, but it does give us an idea about whether people are starting to get more active. And again, the real proof in the pudding will be whether that increase um, in, a, in mobility is translated into increased cases or whether um, people are, are adopting the messages about not going out when you've got even the mildest symptoms, getting, getting tested, hand hygiene, um, social, social distancing. Yeah. And in that case, um, then we can really, I think one of the key things that's been really pleasing about this is to demonstrate how working with the community, we can affect, and through our public health contact tracing, we can actually effectively change the R0. So as you're aware that the effective, the R0 is, is around 2.53 and in some settings may well be higher. So it may be incredibly high in closed environments. But what we know is that we've been effectively able to bring that down, and I just want to acknowledge the work of the community um, in in working with us to do that, to achieve that outcome. Thanks, Dr. Chant. We'll go to uh, Mr. Borzak now. Robert, you'll have to start again because you've, uh, you're on mute. We've unmuted you. Um, start again. Uh, uh, yeah, I know you like shutting me up, mate. That's okay. Um, are you aware of reports from St George Hospital that doctors and nurses have been exposed to risk catching COVID-19 due to a shortage of PPE? That's not true. That's not true. Um, the, uh, where, where sorry, you sorry. You missed, you missed the start of that. I was addressing it to Dr Chant before I was unmuted. I apologise. Yeah, but I'm actually asking you where did you get that report from that people were exposed to COVID? Well, I'm asking, I'm asking the questions here. If, you, if your answer is no, well, it's no. If it's yes, it's yes. Um, I'll, I'll repeat again. Where, what's the source of your information? No, I, and I'm telling you, I'm asking you a question I'd like you to answer, please. If you don't know the answer, tell me so. Sorry, the questions well, have well, to be raised in some here to ask questions. Questions. I'm asking you where that came from. You're obviously well, Minister, not going to answer think... the question. Well, Minister, we'll, we'll Robert, and Robert, Robert and Minister. Take it on notice since you don't want to give us any detail on it. What's the next one, Brian? Well, the, detail of the, question, the detail is in the question. As I said, take it on notice. What's the next question? Well, you didn't say that. You just said it now. Thank you. I've said it has your office, Dr Chan, has your office received any letters or emails from the frontline staff warning that they were at risk due to shortages of PPE? Um, the, there are a, a multiple um, executives that may have received some of that information. Um, I think it's fair to say that there has been concern amongst healthcare workers around PPE, and I can certainly acknowledge their concerns. I mean, I think anyone who watches the news overseas where there have been um, clear shortages in those countries does 
resonate. I think when the case numbers were in, increasing, um, our healthcare workers were very concerned. I, I think some of the problems has been that early on there were the need to um, make sure that we have good logistic supply chains, resupply, and there was also a lockdown of some of the stock, not for the purposes of um, not making it available to healthcare workers, but the normal security you'd, you'd actually expect us to put in place around um, very precious stock. I think, as I've answered my previous question, I'm aware that we need to do better at communicating to healthcare workers um, and have escalation pathways that healthcare workers know how to navigate if they're having a problem with, they don't feel like they've got the right um, PPE for their circumstance, if they um, have a, you know, no access to something. That Those problems often reflect um, just a lack of wet to know where to escalate it and effective escalation at a local level. And um, I hope that, that that has been, there's been steps put in place within, within local health districts. And I hope that some of those issues were historically nature, but if they are ongoing, they just reflect that we have to do more to reassure healthcare workers that there is an adequate supply of PPE. And I just want to acknowledge the work in the whole of government to actually procure um, PPE. And Dr. Chant, so you're, you're saying that there is correspondence, emails, letters, perhaps in your office or in the New South Wales Health. Uh, could you table that? For those, she didn't, she didn't I, say that. I, I, didn't, I she didn't, didn't say, say that. that there are, so but I'm just saying well, that um, I'm, I'm saying that I can't preclude that because I don't have this full visibility of all correspondence that come to the Ministry of Health. But I am aware of ad hoc um, media um, reports and those have been investigated. But what I'm concerned about is if there is an ongoing um, concern amongst healthcare workers, it highlights the fact we have to even redouble our efforts with communicating that there are adequate supplies of PPE. Um, we still need to be wise in our use of PPE because it is a, you know, it is a, is a resource that is finite. But we have adequate and I'm, I'm concerned if, if yeah okay thank you um, thank you thank you thank you uh, so you're saying that your office has received no written correspondence complaining about a lack of personal PPE I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm saying that I would not have visibility of every piece of correspondence that has been provided no, but that's not my question um, that's not my question now that's not my question you I'm saying well, what, what have you received saying, as your office received the question, Mr. Borzak. Do you have another question? And, and I uh, no, he hasn't answered the question. Uh, I don't need you to run interference. Thank you, Minister. Actually, um, I'll, I'll tell you what. Sorry, Minister that. and uh, Mr. Oh, Borzak. I'll tell you, you what. Ever, I'll, so tell you what. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. Just asking questions off the back of media. Sorry, I'll sorry, Mr. Borzak and Minister. Dr. Chant, is there anything further you wanted to add to that um, that question about the, the receipt of correspondence? I just wanted. Say in terms of the receipt of correspondence, um, nothing that I can recall at this time. I know that from time to time, that when I've had discussions in clinical groups and other clinicians, the issue of access to PPE has come up. Um, and again, in all of those cases, when it's been raised with me, I've followed up with the relevant um, local health district to ensure that. Okay, so I can't say that I haven't heard the issues around PPE, certainly in our clinical engagement with clinical groups, concerns around PPE access as, as, and availability. And in those cases where it's been raised, we've followed up with the relevant local health district. Thank you. Um, Minister, why uh, were you happy to send Kellyanne Ressler into the Walker inquiry to answer for your mistakes? You know, you really have a problem, but maybe you don't realise there's a commission inquiry going on. I don't intend to answer any questions about that, but I certainly didn't send her there. I didn't ask you a question. I, I didn't ask you a question. I said, why did you send her in there? Yeah. Mr. Borzak, I think you've got to give the minister the opportunity to answer. He was in the middle of his answer. Minister, back to you. First of all, I didn't send Dr. Kersler. Secondly, um, clearly you aren't the slightest bit interested in actually treating her with any respect because She's currently before the commission. 
and to rate her in this particular context is completely inappropriate. Thirdly, can I say that uh, I 100% back all of the health staff at the front line, which is who are working in a very, very difficult situation. In fact, unprecedented in the last 100 years. So I don't think it pays to play politics, Mr. Borzak, but admittedly, that seems to be your main game. I tell you what, I prefer your colleagues out at, uh, at Mr. Butler is a good person, the member for Orange is a good person. You need to take some lessons yeah. from some of your Mi colleagues. Minister, Minister, I think, Minister, I think if we restrict ourselves to questions and you restrict yourself to answering them, um, this, this, will, this will have a much smoother run. Back to you, Mr. Borzak. I Thank, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. I I'm, I'm really do like the fact that I get under your skin, Mr. Hazard. You really deserve it. Um, Dr. Chan. Mr. Borzak, again. Uh, sorry? Again, if Chan, rather than individual observations, questions. Dr. Chan, um, you're not, you're not. She, she was on the four-person four panel that decided on the Ruby Princess release. Um, who was on that panel that made that, those, that decision on the day? Um, Mr. Borzak, not only do you not understand the, the type of question you can ask in a parliamentary committee, you also don't understand that when there's a commission inquiry on, you don't actually canvas matters that are before the that inquiry. Is a simple, that is a simple question that needs a simple but answer. Who are the four people on well, the I agree committee? most questions that come from you are simple, well, I've answered them. I'll take so, the point for the chair. When is Roy Butler and Phil Donato going to um, take over your party? Sorry, Minister, Minister, if you could just, um, <laughs> just pause. And Mr. Borzak, if you could pause, Mr. Khan, on a point of order. At least they live in the bush. When are they going to sack you, Minister Brad? and Mr. Borzak, we when will go to Mr. Khan. sack you? They don't live up in the city claiming to be pro farmers. You're hopeless. Like you, Mr. Borzak. Mr. Khan. How often do you actually get out of the bush for your inner city residents? Uh, Minister, this, this isn't doing anyone credit. We'll go to Mr Khan on the point of order. I, I think there's, uh, there's two points of order that now has arisen. One, the, the first one relates to your opening, where it was indicated that we essentially would not be dealing with the substance of the, the Ruby Princess uh, inquiry. Um, we clearly are straying into that. So that's my first point. And, and in my view, it's not appropriate. For, for that line of questioning to continue at this time. The second point relates to uh, the requirements uh, that are on all members to act with courtesy towards witnesses. Now, I suppose it could be said that's a two-way thing, but nevertheless, it seems to me um, this is losing an appropriate level of civility. Um. Well, I think the point of order on civility is, is well made, and I think that that's an expectation from both the uh, members and the witnesses. So I'd ask members and witnesses to both um, uh, engage with each other in a civil fashion. Um, I agree that we don't want to be second guessing the outcomes of the Special Commission of Inquiry, and we made that clear at the outset. Um, and if the Minister wishes to take that point that the matter is before the inquiry, he's entitled to do that. Um, I'll go back to Mr. Borzak to see if he wants to press that question or if he has one final question. Um, and then that'll bring a conclusion to this particular round. Well, my question is very simple. Why didn't the minister appear in front of the inquiry? Oh, look, seriously, I, I'm not answering that. All right, minister, are you taking that's the point that about, that's um, that a exactly matter before the, sort of the inquiry? It's a matter before the inquiry. In the inquiry, if Mr. Borzak, he's been in parliament for about eight years. If he doesn't understand the, the independence of an inquiry and how the parliamentary processes should respect that, um, then I'm sorry about that, but I do, and I've been there 30 years, and I know exactly how it should work. And uh, I haven't been called before the inquiry. The way he's going, he will be, because he's making all sorts of false assertions. All right, Minister. So um, just just to, to, to end this off, you haven't yet um, received a request to appear before the inquiry, no. and and if you did receive one, um, would you appear before the inquiry? That's a hypothetical. I don't propose to answer hypothetical questions. Thank you, Minister. We'll go over to the opposition. You're I'm muted. sorry, we, we, yeah, we, had a, we, had a, we had we had an excess of muting there in order to um, uh, work our way through that point of order, um, uh, Ms. Sharp um, or or Mr. Seckord or Mr. Um, no, or Adam. It's me, it's, it's me it's Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? We can. Good, um, Minister. Your office has confirmed that New South Wales Health has provided health services to those in Newmarch, including. 
through the hospital in the home program. Minister, are you aware of concerns held by relatives of residents about the shortcomings of that program? In particular, that in Newmarch there are no x-ray machines and apparently no monitors for heart rates or oxygen saturation in blood which are necessary to provide medical care. What are you doing to ensure the residents in Newmarch are getting the full suite of medical care they need? I'll ask Dr Chair to answer that. The, um, I would have to refer to the advice of the infectious disease specialist who is providing care and can I just acknowledge the infectious disease specialist who has been in that facility. I will follow up after this commission to see if there's any concerns around adequacy of um, equipment to adequately monitor patients in that facility. Okay. Minister, are you also aware that with those in Newmarch who have passed, there is some concerns that they might not have received the full suite of end of life care, including pain relief? Are you aware of those concerns held by some relatives of residents at Newmarch? And what are you doing to address them? I'll refer that to Dr Chair. Um, I believe that Nepean Blue Mountains had in place a, also uh, a, a geriatric um, palliative care team um, available. Um, there was also the role of the general practitioners. So again, any, I mean, I would be concerned if anyone did not receive appropriate end of life care. I think it's such an essential part of um, health care. So if you'd like to raise any of those concerns, we can follow up with the team to see if the referral was made and if there was a plan put in place to support end of life um, care. I under understand that there were advanced care directives in place for the large number of um, the residents there. So again, I would be happy to investigate any circumstances you'd like to raise. Okay, well, I certainly will follow up on those things. So Minister, to be clear, you're not aware of those concerns. They haven't been raised with you and you, you're not aware of them. Uh, Mr. So I have um, uh, any, any issues that are raised by my Liberal or Labor colleagues, any of them, and there are many, uh, my office responds and uh, certainly I respond usually to make sure that health is aware of those issues and make sure that there's a response, and particularly if family members are feeling that they have not had um, all of the necessary support um, from uh, whoever, then I would find that up. Having said that, um, I haven't received, I just think I haven't received any uh, any requests from you with regard to this issue. So if you well, don't want to raise them with if it's substantive, I have numerous requests from many of your Labor colleagues, uh, a lot of issues, and every single issue has been addressed by me or by my staff, and that's the way it would be. So if you have serious issues and serious I concerns, do. well, you raise, raise them with me, you raise them yeah. with me, and I will make sure they get addressed, because it's horrific to think that there are people who are feeling that their loved ones are not getting yeah. the services, and I would be extremely concerned about that, and it would have been addressed well and truly if you had raised, or any of your colleagues, raise that issue with me, but you haven't. Well, I have only just become aware of them myself. I've been talking with the families. Have you met with the families, Minister, and heard their no. concerns with them? No, but I've made clear to the front no, line. I have, but why haven't office. you met with the family? Why haven't you met with no the family? No request. And you haven't okay. made that request to me either. Well, um, I understand that, but I'm asking you, so you haven't reached out to well, the you family? You haven't requested it. Nobody has requested it, and the family are being looked after by the various uh, doctors. What was that wink for, Mr. Searle? What was that wink about? Wink. No, no, it's Yes, you just winked. It was well and truly on TV that you winked. You, you two are yes, in uh, more interested in the policy. Question. You're more interested uh, in the community. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, mem really members and minister. Up. Members, members and minister. Again, if we could treat each other both sides with courtesy, this will be a, a far more beneficial for the for the public who actually want to get this information. Out. And, and so, but I think it's a responsible senior I, I think it's of an opposition uh, on a bipartisan minister, approach. Minister, minister, my, 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 support. Yeah, minister, my observations, my observations that are to all participants in this inquiry. If we could treat each other with courtesy and not try to inflame situations. Well, just remind you, Chairman. Just remind you, Mr. Chairman, that uh, yeah, I think we have participated. But there have been three different webinars involving all members of parliament, yep. and not uh, one of these issues been raised. Not once yep. have they come to my office with any names Min of people who well, want well, to Well, Minister, I attended. 
Well, well, Minister, 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 we'll go back to the opposition now, back to the question and answer. Okay, well, okay, well, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, my question is to the Minister. Minister, um, uh, healthy patients, sorry, healthy residents at Newmarch uh, have only just been separated from those with COVID-19, I think, from in recent times. Why did New South Wales Health or you as Minister not intervene earlier to ensure that separation COVID-19 infected persons from other Let's get something very, very clear here. You are coming to this from a political uh, perspective. No, I'm just asking you the question. I'm no, no, you, you, question. You, even your press releases, you know, your spokesman and your leader have shown an immaturity beyond imagination, which has not Minister, been displayed by like any other Labor Party around the country. If you're really interested, question. many of your Labor colleagues have come to me with serious issues and every one of them have been addressed. On that particular issue, I'll just make it very clear. If and when you ever, ever get to be in government and you are made the health minister, hopefully you will take advice and not become an instant expert in everything. Because at the moment you seem to think you are. You are not a met, you are not a clinician, nor am I. I take advice from the clinicians. I'll ask Dr. Chan to give the advice that you're seeking, Dr. Chan. Um, so just to clarify, sorry, so could you clarify your comment? Um, so are you um, just in terms of the patients you're saying that people shared rooms that no no i just i just said no no recently in recent times i've read and heard that patients with covid 19 so residents with covid 19 at new Sorry. have been separated from those who were covid 19 free and i was just querying why that separation hadn't occurred at an earlier time including why new south wales hadn't intervened so, to ensure that <coughs> So I'm, I'm sorry if there's a misunderstanding in the way that this has been communicated, but um, individuals are in their own room and they are isolated and staff are using PPE um, for all, for all the patients. There, um, there are three wings in this facility and there is one wing where there hasn't been COVID positive residents and whilst we are um, you know, we, we, I'm always cautious because I understand the 14-day incubation period and obviously we have had new cases amongst the staff, so we're particularly vigilant. Um, but that, that cohorting has happened. What I think you're alluding to, um, Mr. Deferl, is that in the other two wings, there, there clearly has been separation. But as patients are cleared of COVID infection, then there can be further reconfiguration in those two other wings. Um, in order to um, ensure that we're very clear that non-infected uh, or people that haven't had COVID or people that are at risk of incubating are separated again. But again, it, but just to be clear, all of the patients were in their own room. There was infection control procedures in place with wearing staff wearing PPE. Um, but this goes to even as we go through and wait for 14 days, it's clear who's been infected and who hasn't and there can be further reassortment. But this reflects the fact that daily there are specialist in experts, including preeminent um, infectious disease experts on behalf of the Commonwealth. Um, our infectious disease specialist um, from Nepean Blue Mountains, who is attending that, and, and the plans are adjusted as we work through this evolving um, situation. So, just to be clear, the residents were um, isolated and separated. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chan. M Minister, 71% uh, of the COVID-related deaths in New South Wales come from aged care or from the Ruby Princess. Does your government accept any responsibility for those deaths, the 16 deaths at Newmarch House and the 22 deaths from the Ruby Princess? Um, the, uh, the government has worked extremely hard along with uh, all of the frontline health staff um, and all of the other agencies to work together. And uh, as Dr. Chant answered that question before, um, the aged care facilities and cruise ships across the world have been highly problematic. Um, New South Wales actually leads the world in its results at this point. Now, none of that detracts from me saying that I'm sorry that uh, people have lost loved, one, loved ones. That's an extremely sad situation. But also that's what's happening across the world. And so we need to be cognizant of the fact that the government 
has done, as have all the Labor and Liberal governments around the country and the federal government, an extraordinary job working with the community. None of this, none of these good, good results could have been done without the community being on board with these issues. And they have accepted the decisions and they have worked with us. Meanwhile, unfortunately, you uh, and uh, perhaps suffering relevance deprivation syndrome, you and your colleagues have been putting out non bipartisan press releases which have not contributed one iota to any of the positive outcomes. Um, could I just interrupt at that point because I've got the healthcare worker data and I'm happy to provide that at an appropriate point, but I defer to the chair of the committee. Oh, now would be useful. Thanks, Dr. Chant. And then we'll go back to opposition. Okay. Dr. Okay. So in terms of the um, healthcare worker, we've got 30 healthcare workers acquired their infection overseas, two as a result of interstate travel, 13 were a household contact of a confirmed case, seven were a close contact or casual contact of a confirmed case, 10 were linked to a known cluster outside a healthcare facility, and there were 80, 82 possible healthcare worker exposures. Of those 82, um, 49 out of the 82 were in, in a public New South Wales healthcare facility. As I said, these are possible healthcare exposures. Uh, 12, 15, 12 of the 82, 15% were in a private New South Wales health facility. 20 out of the 82, 25%. 24% were in primary health care community setting, and one was in a public interstate facility. Thanks, Dr. Chan. Opposition? Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Minister, on the 23rd of April, the Commonwealth Chief Medical Officer told the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19 that in May 2019, a pandemic planning, planning exercise was done in partnership with New South Wales Health, and that included modelling in relation to cruise ships. Minister, why didn't that work in connection with the Ruby Princess? What went wrong? Uh, Point of order, Chair. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Ms Ward. To be clear, I'm not asking about the Special Commission of Inquiry. I'm asking about the pandemic. Let me, take my, let me, Adam, let me take my point right. of order. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to Ms Ward. We'll go to Ms Ward. Natalie. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's been very clear and it's been reinforced that this committee's purview is not to canvas the issues which are currently under consideration by the Special Commission of Inquiry. Um, the member is clearly going there. I don't care what his commentary is. Um, we've agreed on that and I don't know that um, it is useful to attempt to go back there for political reasons. Once again, I object to the question. I ask you to draw him to the subject matter that we are here to consider and that the people of New South Wales want us to talk about, which is not what is being considered by the Special Commission. All right, thanks, Ms Ward. Um, I, I think the, the Minister and Dr Chant know the scope of this inquiry, um, and I think the Minister had just referred it to Dr Chant. Dr Chant, if there's anything you wish to add, I noting think, that think, earlier discussion benefit, about the scope of this inquiry. Uh, Mr Chairman, with the benefit of uh, Ms Ward's uh, most astute observation, I think it's wise that uh, there be no further comment on that matter, because clearly it's before the Commission of Inquiry. And I also note that the double banged assumption anyway under underlying what a question if that was a question that was used in court it wouldn't get past first base and I'm surprised that such well, an well, well, uh, Minister, we're doing well there before that last little bit of gloss and we'll I'll hand just it back to, to the opposition. Minister, the just National just Cabinet Minister, the National Cabinet is Mr Chairman, uh, Mr. Dr yeah. Chad is showing a remarkable interest in at least giving some General comments no. with regard yeah, to I, I could I, I could I could see Dr. Chant had something she wanted to put on the record. <laughs> Dr. Chant will go to, We will go to Dr. Chant and then we'll come straight to Mr. Graham. I have learned as health minister for the last three and a half years and Dr. Chant wants to say something, it's wise of me just to keep quiet and let her do it. So well, I suppose just as a general response to say that New South Wales Health recognised the challenges of cruise ships and at the time I believe there's also been, you know, early advisories from the Australian Health Protection Principle committee providing advice around the warnings around the risks of amplification of COVID-19 in closed settings, in particular cruise ships. So cruise ships have been clearly um, identified as an issue. New South Wales had actually done extensive planning for cruise ships. So for instance, we had actually planned for how we would provide meals on a cruise ship and how we would get early disembarkation of people from a cruise ship. 
Um, and the reason for that is we'd learned the lessons from the Diamond Princess, whereby when people are actually on the cruise ship, continued exposure occurs. We had worked through isolating people in hotels. We planned for meals and how we would do that. We planned for how people would get off cruise ships through health share. I don't want to comment on the particular decision making about this um, event because that is part of the inquiry. But I just want to, to reassure members that health had actually done extensive planning for the contingency of COVID-19 being recognised on a cruise ship including how we would disembark patients and our approach to those. Thank you. Thanks, Dr Chan. I think that was the substance of Mr Searle's inquiry. Mr Graham. Uh, Minister, National Cabinet meets tomorrow to consider a plan to open up the economy in three stages. When will the New South Wales Government finally set up the order in which restrictions will be lifted? That's what Victoria is doing, operating in stages. The Northern Territory set out a roadmap with uh, stages and dates and the US government led by the CDC is doing the same thing. When will the public here know what are the stages, not necessarily the timing, uh, what happens at each stage? Why is it that they're left uh, really watching the Premier's 8am press conference to find out whether they can go to the beauty parlour or go to a property auction? When is New South Wales gonna spell out those stages? Um, thank you, uh, Mr Graham. Mr Graham, the, um, every day for about close to 70 days, the Premier has stood up um, and fronted the cameras and talked to the community about how this is being managed. I don't think anybody could have asked for a Premier to be more engaged and more communicative with the public, and I think you would find the public actually generally accept that. She also spends a very large amount of her day working on these issues, as do I, um, in fact, it's almost exclusively, unfortunately, um, on COVID and COVID-related matters. But you also have to understand that she is part of the National Cabinet, where your colleagues, I think the majority are Labor colleagues around the country, um, are also engaged with uh, the Liberal Premier and the other uh, Liberal, Liberal Prime Minister to determine what is appropriate at various stages. She will make sure that she actually gives that information as she has. He was talking about these issues again this morning, and I don't think that so uh, you could ask for any more from any Premier. She is doing exactly what you would expect of a Premier. Uh, Minister, why are we I going restriction add... by restriction and industry by industry, rather than simply setting out the stages, not the timing, so we know as we're moving out Can of I restrictions say, Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, what fits Minister, in those my, stages? Mr Graham, as Health Minister, and uh, this is actually talking to the Health Ministry at the moment, and the Minister, my focus has been about keeping the community safe from COVID. And I think you'd have to say so far, the frontline health staff and the Ministry of Health and the 15 local health districts have all done an enormous job. They've worked with police, they've worked with customer service, they've worked with all of the government agencies that are relevant and the federal government. And we have and I, extraordinary- I congratulate them for that. I might turn to- Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham this, this, this period of questioning has Time has elapsed. I Thank think you. Dr. Chant had a little bit that she wanted to add. We might go, Minister, if you had concluded that moment. Um, yeah, fine. Thank to, you. Yeah, Dr. Chant. Um, it was just more about the fact that there is a national process. I think the Premier has spoken about that, where by the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee is giving advice around that, that roadmap, as you say, it about this mm. balance that I discussed with. Um, Discern earlier, um, and I think that it was clear that the Premier um, indicated that she's been attending National Cabinet, and National Cabinet is meeting regularly. So I think in due course, those um, those issues will be um, still at least, but we're working very much in a national way, um, guided by the advice of the Australian Health Pre Protection Principle Committee. All right. The Australian Health uh, Protection Committee, Mr. Graham, is out of interest, is every Chief Health Officer. They usually meet sometime between 12. 12 p.m., 1 p.m., 2 p.m. every day of the week, um, and they all discuss these issues as it's evolving. Because right now we're sitting Minister, here. Minister, uh, thank you for that, Minister. I'm, I'm, I'm clear on that. I won't, I won't take up the time of other colleagues. Um, th thanks, thanks, Mr. Graham. Thank you, Minister. Um, Minister, I suppose the question that Mr. Graham's asked is a question that many people are asking. Um, can, is there a, is there a, is there a roadmap? Is there a kind of transition path, even if not a timetable? But the, 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 
the manner in which we expect restrictions to be lifted is is that being discussed and when can we see that kind of roadmap you know first it'll be x and then it'll be y and then it'll be z uh, mr shubridge uh, the premier has made that very very clear uh, as late as this morning um, i don't know whether you watch the 8 a.m in the morning but um, I do. Ev excellent well you would know that on many of those occasions i'm there as well and most mornings i'm also taking part in the discussions that occupy all of those decisions about when do we actually feel that the community can um, return more to having the freedoms where we like and we want, um, but keeping them safe. And there is no way that our government or any government, uh, Labor or Liberal, and as evidenced by around the country, want to be doing what we're doing, but we're doing it to make sure that we work with the community to actually safeguard the community. The community have, have largely accepted all that as a result. We have, by far and away, if not the best, certainly amongst the best in the world. Oh, results. Minister, Minister, as we move um, forward, as Minister we move I, don't, I don't doubt that in the past. I, I suppose people are asking, though, you know, is there a plan for the way in which restrictions will be lifted, and, and when will be when will we be advised about what that plan is, Minister? I'm not debating your, your, your every, point. Every every day, the, the situation changes, David. Every day. I remember on the 27th of March, when we got to 212 people who were confirmed cases out of I think only about three and a half thousand uh, people from memory. Um, we have, the people who are actually at the front line of this, who've been working on this, uh, in terms of management, have all been working on a literally a daily basis. And that's right across the country. So for you to be asking for a forward map as such, I don't, yeah. think, I don't think that's a reasonable prospect at this point because circumstances are changing daily. But what I can say is the government here in New South Wales and the Premier has made very clear that she wants to open up more knowing though that it's done in a way that is safe. And hang on, and also in a staged way, because as we do whatever we do, whatever changes we make, we have to be able to evaluate those. And as you've just heard from Dr. Chan earlier in the session, it takes up to 14 days from the time you're infected necessarily showing symptoms. So we have to be at a point where we can actually say, okay, we can do this now, and then evaluate what we're doing. So it's yep. not a case of rushing, because if we did, you would all be saying here, and I can hear that not no, no, so Minister, much, Minister, some of the others sitting on this committee would be saying, you've actually stuffed it up. Yeah, well, no, look, Minister, I, 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 I accept you your said. point. We haven't stuffed it up. We've got it right so far. Minister, and I would like to continue to get it right. Yeah, Minister, so I understand. I understand that as restrictions are lifted, that's going to come with widespread testing and analysis, and then it'll be done in a staged basis. More so than 10,000 all... today. More than 10,000 today. Remarkable. Yeah. Um, yes. and, Minister, yeah, and Minister, one of the questions Ms. Salmon was asking was about whether or not there's a kind of number uh, in terms of the growth factor, so not the RO factor, but the growth factor, whether or not there's, there's a number we should be looking to in the growth factor that as restrictions are lifted in tranches, um, is, is there a kind of red light that, that might indicate we have to go backwards or we don't move any further forward. And, and Ms. Chant, the numbers that I have on the growth figure to date, and they come from an ABC article, where the growth figure was 0.7 on the 12th of February, it hit a high of 1.75 on the 7th of March, and then it's back at 1.04 on the 5th of May. But is, should we be looking to that number, Dr. Chant? Yes, and look, I, I'll look at the source of that number, but I just think we've got to also be very clear about the precision of these numbers. These are modelled yep. numbers, and we need to take in multiple data sources to interpret what is actually going going on. Um, clearly, we need to look at what is the effective R naught. That will be, but how we impute that it will be from those other data points. And the minister makes a very important point that it takes about three weeks. Um, or four, or even up to four weeks before we have confidence, because we need a few mm -hmm. cycles of the incubation period to see any effect on relaxation. And as I said, part of our ability to contact trace and part of our ability to get the population to adhere to our social mes messages means that some of those um, restrictions occur and don't present as much risk, because they effectively serve to change that effective R naught. So, so. Can I take from that that as restrictions are lifted off, we should expect them to happen at, at, a, at a maximum in a period of, say, one month periods where we can then test and get a sense of how those restrictions have worked? Is, and is and that... I would say the Premier has indicated that time and time again that, that based on the scalability of what will be done, 
it's probably on a monthly basis. Having said that, there can be some minor changes that would not necessarily have huge impacts. So we have an open mind yeah. on those issues, as do other jurisdictions. Um, but we need to do it carefully and yeah. steadily and make sure... No, no. And, and my Minister, focus the people who are sitting here with me is to keep people safe. No yeah. politics, no. just keep people safe. No, Minister, so. and I, I think it's been useful finding out where that one-month figure comes from, that, that that's then allowing Dr Chant and others to to do that rigorous population testing to, to see the effect of those measures. Could I ask then about schools? I mean, and I know I'm not asking you as the education minister, I'm asking you as the health minister and your health officials. Um, there, there is understandably a strong press to get year 12 students back. But one of the questions parents and teachers are asking is, how do we classify year 12 students? Are they children in terms of their, the, the impact of the virus upon them and therefore relatively low um, risk or are they or lower risk, or are they adults? Where do Year 12 students fit in terms of the modelling, Dr Chant? So the um, the age profile with COVID is that COVID is generally a mild issue for children and including younger adults, but clearly children seem to behave differently, even further reduced risk. The issue for um, young adults is we're, start, we're, we're going to be starting in schools um, young adults um, for year 11 to 12. And interestingly, we haven't seen any year, um, I'd have to double check, but they haven't been a significant feature of outbreaks um, in New South Wales or more broadly. So our, our advice around year 12, 11 and 12 would be the same. Um, a, the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee throughout has actually um, indicated that um, we are comfortable that schools remain open through this period and we acknowledge the important role schools have and the benefits that education afford um, young people. But we will continue to, um, we're working in partnership with the National Centre for Immunisation Research and we'll continue to um, investigate schools. Um, for instance, in the recent case, we had a seven-year-old at Warragamba Public School. There's been yep. extensive testing and we will continue to update the community um, because Australia is probably one of the few countries in the world that can actually look at um, transmission rates in these settings because in other countries where there's more widespread community transmission, we can't explore this question. All right, Dr Chan, my last question is, given that when we're talking about lifting broader restrictions in the community, it's going to require about a month to do the testing to see about asymptomatic carriage and the like, is that the same advice you're giving in relation to schools? And do you have a process where it'll happen on a kind of monthly basis and the asymptomatic testing for asymptomatic carriage is going to be part of the rollout in schools? So look, the value of asymptomatic um, testing, and there's a, a national um, pandemic intelligence plan, and the role of asymptomatic testing is really um, in certain settings, not associated with more broad scale asymptomatic screening. It's important that we focus on symptomatic because that will give us um, a higher surety of what's going on in the population. How, notwithstanding that, we are going to be using asymptomatic um, screening much more broadly in settings such as school, in settings such as um, aged care facilities um, to actually make sure that we understand the disease spreading the school at the earliest possible um, base and collect more information. So it's two-edged, both our public health response, but also to ensure that we generate new evidence we will continue to do that active work in schools and um, we are prioritising schools in terms of our response. And, and, as I said, yeah. and have you dealt with the consent issues if we're testing children? Uh, how are you uh, going to work on consent in those circumstances? Um, so this will be um, through the usual process where parents, um, depending on the age of the child, um, the normal consent processes occur. Um, and we will be following those and where it's clearly research, we'll be using research um, premises for um, ethical issues will be covered through the useful research and ethics um, framework, notwithstanding I think the recognising now, perhaps more even than we did probably in term one, the value that um, testing um, asymptomatic and um, symptomatic people at even day one of um, the introduction of a where a child has been infectious at school may give us um, valuable information at knowing um, the scope at that time. Thanks, Dr. Chamster Borzak.
Oh, I'm unmuted this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Chan, uh, just a little bit more to the um, uh, how you come about making or coming uh, creating your advice to the minister and obviously to the cabinet. Um, what are the issues and inputs that influence your advice uh, on, say, lifting movement restrictions between uh, the city and regional New South Wales? How is so, it done? What are um, so a number of our advice is, is um, overall um, the there is a national processes that the prim, that that um, the minister indicated. Um, as New South Wales has never had um, total restrictions. It's been around you can only travel for work, um, essential health care, and um, for care and, no, really and not, care and support. So there has been um, the ability to travel, but under those limited um, circumstance, circumstances. The key issue is um, at what point um, the economy can more broadly open up, and that will be guided by the work that's being done in terms of the public health advice that's being provided, and that will be considered by national cabinet. But the sort of issues that we'll be considering is what is what is the um, locally acquired cases? What's their distribution? Are they all linked to existing clusters? Um, is there more widespread community transmission? We will also have a particular view additionally in terms of some very rural remote areas, um, particularly Aboriginal communities. We might put additional restrictions and that's because of the challenges should um, COVID-19 get introduced into those communities. And so there is work with um, our um, Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council and those rural communities, um, in particular plans around those discrete Aboriginal communities in addition. So overall, um, our advice will be through that national um, process, but there's some of the factors that we all consider about what additional risk is introduced by having people more move more widely. Well, how, how much testing uh, is actually being done? I, I see, I certainly heard this morning and I heard the Minister talking a little while ago and I heard the Premier this morning also talking about a record number of tests that were done, I think 10,900 yesterday, which is very good as far as I'm concerned. But um, how much of those are being done outside of Sydney? So um, just to give you context, Australia's had um, early testing and at higher rates than most other countries, and that's really allowed us to map the map the disease um, in the community. And that's in contrast, um, contrast to some other countries where when they started their testing, they were finding positivity rates in the order of 50%. Um, in terms of the um, test, we keep data and collect data across each of our local health districts. And um, we provide this data. So, for instance, in Murrumbidgee, there's testing rates in the order of um, 15.43 per 100,000 residents. In Mid North Coast, it's 22.16 per 100,000 residents. So, we do keep that. Uh, that's an example I'm reading off a testing chart that we have that released publicly. We're also, um, that's a key part of our strategy is to provide this information to the district so they can look at where there might be gaps and where they might need to work in partnership with general practice on increasing testing. And as I indicated, it's also important that we look at any vulnerable groups or um, vulnerable workers in those settings that may not be readily accessing testing because it's about overall testing, but it's also about testing in all of those subpopulations within our districts. And the district structure ensures that people have a good understanding of their local communities and can put those plans and work in partnership with primary care to ensure those testing rates are, are high and also comprehensive. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chant. Would you be more interested in seeing the regions open first rather than Sydney? I think, the, I think that's really a matter for government. Um, the Premier has spoken about her views on that, um, so that's really a matter for government. But, uh, Dr Chant, uh, government says they rely on your advice. 
Well, I think there's a question about um, the level of, of measures that need to be put in place, and it's a question about implementation of those measures. I think there are sometimes concerns if we have variable measures, how do we communicate that effectively? And also then do you provide incentives for people to move to those areas? And so I think it does require that whole of government lens around um, other government agencies will have views around the flow on impact of how health might pronounce something but then how that actually operates in the real world. And I do value the expertise across our other government agencies um, that go to the implementation issues of any associated with any health advice. Um, uh, Dr Chant, uh, Minister Emma's Koff, um, we, we have run out of time, unfortunately, for questions. Um, could I thank all the members? Could I thank all the members of the, the committee um, for their engagement today? Could I particularly thank um, Ms. Koff, Dr. Chant, and the Minister um, for making yourself available um, for, for answering and providing that information, not, not to the members, but to the public. Um, we, will, we will now um, we'll now conclude the, the webcast. Um, and again, thank you for your attendance today. And if the members could stay online, we'll have a brief. Can, I, can I just uh, thank the uh, committee as well, generally anyway, thank the committee, but also stress the need for a bipartisan approach. That's what's actually kept Australia safe, and it should be continued that way. Can I also strongly encourage all members of parliament who wish to have issues raised on behalf of their community to come straight to my office because we respond as quickly as we humanly can to any issues. And thirdly, I'd just like to make a point to the community. Thank you for all the work you've done in terms of being on board with this great journey to try and keep everybody safe. Because so far, the community has been the one that's actually made the difference. They are the people who've actually stayed at home despite wanting to be out. They're the people who've actually kept uh, New South Wales as amongst the leaders of the world in terms of uh, fighting back against this yeah. very dangerous virus. And finally, to the colleagues from Parliament, don't forget webinars are held uh, regularly and you're more than welcome to come online and ask any question. Most of you have my phone number anyway, but you can also ask Dr Chan during those webinars. Um, if you have any other issues, so those will continue. Thank you very much to- Thank you, Mr. Minister. And I think our, our collective thanks goes to the community. Um, and that concludes today's hearing. Thank you.